podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Here, we love talking about everything Batman. The BatmanUniverse.net has news, original content, and reviews about Batman comics, movies, TV shows, video games, and more. Check out the BatmanUniverse.net and join our Discord server to start chatting with fellow fans. We can't wait to talk to you guys. Also, visit our Patreon page and join our other awesome supporters. But enough of this nonsense. On with the show. Gotham City, like any other large metropolis, abounds in girls of all shapes and sizes. Debutantes, nurses, stenographers, and librarians. Gotham City Library, Miss Gordon speaking. Lopez hair removal, this is Jose. Holy transformation. One minute, plain Barbara Gordon, librarian and Commissioner Gordon's daughter. And the next minute, something new has been added. Batgirl, modeled after her idol, Batman. Holy apparition. No, boy wonder, I'm Batgirl. You are no longer alone, Cape Crusader. It took me three years to track down the Jade Gato, and three more to figure out how to steal it. Funny, it only took me ten minutes to figure out how to snatch it back. No matter how you do it, crime doesn't pay girls. Mihi Noman asked Stella at Hawk Esk after the Oracle. The Barbara Gordon Podcast, episode 242 for January MMXXIV. Back from the Oracle is brought to you by MileHighComics.com, your new and collectible comic book store. Mile High Comics has an inventory of over 5 million comics from the gold, silver, bronze, and modern age, and over 100,000 trade paperbacks. If you're not into the vintage stock, Mile High Comics also has a subscription service called the New Issue Comics Express, offering a discounted price for comics ready to hit the shelves. So if you're looking for vintage back issues or a great modern subscription service, be sure to check out MileHighComics.com. Well, this is somewhat of a special episode. The guy that you see on the screen and we'll hear from soon, some people use him for his body, but here on Backroll the Oracle, we use him for his brain. So please welcome one of my dear friends, erstwhile lover, Big D himself, Donovan Morgan Grant. Well, what if you use both my body and my brain in two separate occasions? So are you some of those people or are you a distinct third? Me nodding. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. I did hear of a term at one point called a sapiosexual, which is a person who is attracted to intellectual people. I, mm-hmm. I, could, I think I think both of us could probably style ourselves that we're probably going to lean more towards romantic connections with people that are intelligent, I would say, than not. Yeah, it makes you sound like the, like the smart, you know, contemplative, forward thinking pervert. Forward thinking pervert. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, we are here to talk about, I mean, if you can tell by what Donovan is wearing, but I, what I am wearing, uh, this little guy that's up here by Barbara that I have, 
We're going to be talking some Marvel's Spider-Man 2 that came out in, I guess it was December, on the PS5. Uh, maybe November, maybe November. Maybe okay. November. I mean, it was a tough time for me to yeah. be sure, not being able to to do something. Maybe it was earlier because if Josh is talking about bringing, <laughs> bringing it to Texas for the wedding, then it might've been earlier. I can always fact check that. Donovan and I also are, well, I might be more overjoyed than he is. Currently, I'm watching White Stuff. And no, I'm not talking about cocaine, but White Stuff fall mm. down from the sky. It snowed over the weekend. It's snowing now. It fills my heart with joy just to see it snowing here. But I mean, for you, it's caused some consternations to be sure, because you live on this huge hill. Yeah, I live on this death hill. It's like, it's on Sunday night, all the customers were saying, hey, what's, what are you going to do if it snows? And I was like, oh, I think it's going to snow like two days from now. And then we all looked outside and we were like, uh-oh. <laughs> so we closed early and we, you know, we skittishly went to the parking lot and I drove down the highway with both eyes wide open yeah. and both hands on the steering wheel. And I just knew instinctively that I wasn't, I wasn't making the hill. I was, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised I made it even too... My neighborhood, because when I was getting off of like the highway onto the onto like the road down there, I was it was wasn't breaking. I was sliding and stuff. So my car has been outside since Sunday. Today we're recording to date stamp this on a Friday. You know, I like snow as much as the next person, but like as you're an adult, <laughs> some things that you enjoyed as a kid are really incapacitating when you're an adult. Yeah, because like I can't I can't go anywhere, and I my car does not have a four wheel drive. So it's just, it's, it's frustrating. I mean, it's not so much like, oh, I hate snow. It's just like, I just hate the circumstances. It reminds me when I went to deliver pizzas and twice my car got stuck on ice because I had to go to these treacherous, uh, treacherous addresses. But um, yeah. I guess you can drive wherever you want because you're so happy. <laughs> I'm just happy enough to, to sit here and, and watch it, to be honest. School was out because as a teacher, I think I have, there's more like leeway. As a sub, I don't have any responsibilities when I'm back to teaching, obviously I'll be like working to to fix plans and, and reschedule and everything. But we were off Tuesday and Wednesday, and then Thursday was a two hour delay, and then we're off today. Now I do, of course, work a second job. I close at Michael's. So Tuesday, because no one plowed my apartment complex and I was just hearing people skidding around the entire time, I ended up calling out. But today, yeah, I can just sit here and talk to you and I'll probably do some UVA work since my final semester of grad school has begun. But other than that, yeah. Yeah, I love it. I mean, that's why I, I hope to move someplace where there's there's more more snow. So we'll see. Well you know, another I, thing, I, I, I actually yeah? was very um um sorry. I actually was very productive the first day. I actually got a lot of DC work done. Ooh. Um and my Nightwing review and edited Huna Way, which I'll talk about later. Um, so the first day was pretty productive, but now I'm kind of like a spinning top and just, you know, wait, ready to leave. But that, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Like, what, what, what are we talking about today? I was just going to say that another thing that brings me joy, of course, are peaches, peaches in the wild, peaches on social media, peaches in comic books. And we're going to talk. We're <laughs> you and we're going to talk about this juicy peach that you can see on the screen later just because it seemed to have i seem to have seen this more before i even played the game that people were talking about it or cake i i guess i did have a twitter poll because i wondered whose peach is juicier is it venom's peach that you see on the screen or is it our good friend donovan's and unfortunately donovan did not get a lot of love <laughs> Now, it's only been up for like 20, uh, maybe 15 hours, but three people out of the four that voted said Venom has a juicier peach and only one person voted Donovan. And I can't vote on my own polls. So Donovan, did you vote for yourself? I don't think I did. <laughs> okay. I'm pretty sure I did. Well, it's also because like I, like the only time I've ever showed pictures of myself on Twitter that aren't kind of like, like, like every now and then I'll show project projects, progress photos. And those are relatively tame they're, they're no more lewd than your average chris hemsworth image yeah was when i did that photo shoot last year yep, yep. uh so i don't know how I, I i don't know how many people are aware of my second instagram page sure so that's probably why venom was highly skewed because more people have played that game than <laughs> signed up for my instagram page which I is understand. which is fine yeah 44 people have seen the the post, but I guess they just kind of scrolled past it. But now I just wonder who is the person who voted for your peach? It wasn't Harry because I asked if he was on X. He's no longer on X. Maybe it's some like dark, dark wolf that we wouldn't like Professor Cheapskate. He's the one who voted for you. Someone just out of left field. 
Maybe it was Ian. <laughs> Maybe it was Ian Prime. Okay. So that's, we're done with the funny business now. We'll get back to that a little bit, bit. but we are going to talk about Marvel Spider-Man 2 uh, just to, I guess, get it out of the way immediately. Did you enjoy this game? Oh yeah, 100%. Okay. And I would agree. I enjoyed it. I think both Donovan and I are 100% completed. I've got the the platinum. I'm waiting to play it again when uh, New Play Plus comes out so I can like focus on the story because I'm sure I missed things uh, rather than, you know, getting all of the <laughs> going to different hideouts and, and all the collectibles and things like that. But I feel like you and I shared a similar story because with each system that's come out, I personally have said like, that's the last system I'm getting, which is like PS3, last system I'm getting. And then Uncharted 4 came out. I'm like, okay, fine. And you ended up getting your PlayStation 4 for Marvel Spider-Man 1. And then, okay, now we're getting all of this stuff with Marvel Spider-Man 2. You and I, I think, are both hoping that it's going to be cross-gen or just multiple generations so we've got ps4 and ps5 but no it's ps5 so we both have this hard decision you end up getting it i'm still waiting because i just feel like oh i i can't do it it's just like financially i think irresponsible is gonna wait and we know i've already told this story about my mysterious uh benefactor that got for me so both of us have gotten the system for this game i would say we were just so stoked for it Unfortunately, you had a, a bad time of it because of social media. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and kind of your experience playing it initially? Because you got it obviously way before me, and I think you're more on social media than I am. So I did not get uh, kind of the spoilers that you did. Yes, you mentioned, uh, <clears throat> oh, well, Harry's not on on X. I still call it Twitter. And I was like, I'm surprised I still am because I was kind of vowing by the end of the year to be off of it because... I think Twitter has just have had no chill. I talked about this on our end of the year episode when I was talking about the game on Questions We Don't Have Answers. That when I played the first game, I, you know, when, when I got, when I got, I was I was actually on the phone with you and talking about getting a PS4 for the game. And I I didn't play the first Spider-Man game. I think right when it came out, I think it had been out for a little bit and it gotten good reviews. I have no memory of social media just sort of swarming discussion on the game more than I would have wanted. So I played that game very easily in regards to, you know, just pl- having that, that, that unique experience, that, that personal experience. And it might be because of, the, because of the algorithm, but I just feel that like the moment this game came out, everyone was just talking. And so everyone had this singular, singular instrumentality experiment esque like, you know, experience where the, everyone just knew everything like, Oh man, I can't believe that Dr. Octopus is at the end of the game. I can't believe that this has happened. I can't believe that. So it's, you know, Craven killed this character. I can't believe. And I, I, I was just like, guys, God, like, like it, it wasn't even like, you know, I'd gone weeks without, and that the game had been out. It was like days. It was like two days. And that's just not been, it's not been just that. There's, you know, there's been exploring the end of the Marvels and various other things. There's just, there's just no sense of cordialness or whatever. And it just made me, I mean, I don't, I don't like Twitter, comics, Twitter anyway. I mean, you know, you mentioned this last episode with uh, people were talking about Birds of Prey, but like, I feel yeah. that like, it's just been uh, polluted with like the worst faith uh, Zoomers who really don't ever know what they're talking about. Like I can get, to, I can get to that later on. If, should we tangent? But, but like, I've really had it with social media and it's primarily due to comics, Twitter. Um, which this game's fans are a part of. So when I was initially playing, like when I first played the main story, it was, I was kind of just grinding through it just so I wouldn't be spoiled. And that definitely negatively impacted my experience with it because I was rushing through the story. I didn't do hardly any of the side quests at all. Maybe I did like the museum one or, you know, while I was doing the main storyline, but me, most of those I was just, just grinding through and it wasn't fun. I mean, it, it, was, or it, was, it wasn't as fun as it should have been. Now, I really enjoy this game and much that has kind of been from the freed up experience after the main story when I was playing this the side quest. And I wasn't spoiled on everything. There were some genuine surprises. So I can safely say that I really much enjoy this game, although it was difficult going through it. And it wasn't even the game's fault. It was losers on Twitter, basically. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, I don't know what our responsibility is. I, I guess you're you're right, use the word you know, being cordial, I think at least having a sensitivity that, hey, if you're in Australia and you got it 20 hours in advance of US, then maybe don't, you know, let for pe- allow people to catch up and 
experience things without spoiling it. But um, I don't know. I It's either we can give them grace and be like, they're just so excited to share these things. Or if there is kind of like a darkness in their heart and they're like, I'm just going to do this to spite everybody. But it wasn't even uh, like, a, like, a, oh, spoiler tag. It was yeah. just like images. I can't believe it, is it? And it's like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> And so obviously uh, Donovan has mentioned a couple things and I'm going to put it at, at the, you know, in the show notes and everything, but we are going to like go deep into some spoilers. So, and hopefully enough time has passed that it can be allowable now since we're in January. But if you don't want to learn about this, then I just go to the second half of this episode where we will be talking about birds of prey, but I was only spoiled on two things. And it was just because of Instagram and that I follow IGN. I saw an image of Sandman, which I did not know he was in the game. And at least he's the first villain, like a cold opening kind of villain. So it wasn't too bad, but I was still upset about that. And so every other time I just kind of scrolled up and then I don't recall how I found out, but that scorpion got killed. I, I think if before you even play the game, if you had found that out, I think you realize like, oh, this is which we're going to talk about him. This is just like not your dad's craven or not your mother's, you know, it's like, it's just a completely different guy. So I, I lucked out. I got to take my time. I like to do some missions and then spend time in the city. And it, it was just a, a glorious experience, which uh, we'll, we'll certainly talk about, but I, I think I texted you at one point because we had been sharing some images back and forth via the the PlayStation messaging. And, oh, I think you sent me a uh, an Instagram reel about, you know, the PlayStation 1 Spider-Man, which we both love, versus, you know, this PS5 one. And I was just astounded. I think it was the first day where I was just on the top of a building and I could see across, I think, the Hudson, the details of other buildings over there. And I'm like, I just stood there for a moment because I thought, look at how far games have come that we're not looking into fog. We're not looking into boxy yeah. outlines and things. It's just like, it is a beautiful game once you get down to it. And I think the story is very beautiful as well. Which we're going to talk about, I do also want to talk about, I've entitled this the wokeness of it all, <laughs> because I think that's another thing that popped up on social media. You made me more aware of it than I did. I have, you know, The Last of Us Part Two, which I've already talked about, obviously, on the, its own episode. I, it kind of made me crazy how people were like dead set against something, would go after the actor's who are portraying a fictional character, that sort of thing. So I, I just try to stay away from it. And I didn't realize that people were going after this game as much. The hair thing, Miles's hair, I knew people had an issue with that, which kind of was befuddling. I didn't know about that they had a problem with Haley's level, which is probably my favorite level in the game, to be honest. But I did. The only time that I was taken out of my experience was the side mission at Horizon, where you as Miles, you're helping a guy plan a, a prom ask, a promposal for his boyfriend. So oh, that was yeah, the yeah, only yeah. time I was like, I wonder what people are thinking about this. Because I enjoyed it, you know, as a shipper. But I'm just like, uh-oh. But what what is your experience of, because, you again, you know a little bit more of this, kind of the, I don't know, what, what were people saying about it? And is that just where we are now with video games that we're just going to inject negativity into things that are happening that are more progressive I mean, that's the thing with culture like it's like every single thing i mean i saw that people or i say people one loser tried to put you know who's from that crowd tried to put on oh my god marvel made a female deaf native american you know amputee hero and everyone was like she's been around since 1999 <laughs> like you are you are a fake fan i don't want to mention too much because i don't want to i don't want to Get too far into it, but Josh also right. played before I did, so so he could, you know, you know how Josh just doesn't care about spoilers at all. He told me about like the topic in terms of like people are feigning offense because there's like this boyfriend subplot, and you play as Haley. So I was aware of those before I got to those. I think the the boyfriend thing was actually the last subplot I did as Miles, at least. I think that I, I like that that this game is so progressive because it's first of all it's New York, yeah. and New York is not Texas. Secondly, it just matches the Spider-Man comics, in my opinion. Like, if you if you go back to the trajectory, the Spider-Man comics, you know, even when Steve Ditko was in the book, as as less politically progressive as he was compared to Stan Lee, there were still, like, black characters in the background. You've got, like, you know, the, the Robertson family. You've got the discussions on race that lasted for a year. I just went over that last year. That, that There was a lot of that going on. 
You have, um, I think his name is Max Modell. I think that's the hair's name. Oh, There's yeah. a gay yep. character in Marvel Comics. You've got Sanjani. You know, the whole, I think Miles has done a great bit for diversity in Spider Man comics. And I think across the Spider Verse itself is a testament to the power of those comics because it is, it is just drenched in diversity, but it, isn't really, it doesn't really signpost it. And I think that, like, because I think virtue signaling is a real thing. I think that's that's not that's that's not like how conservatives use the term woke. Like I think that it, that can be done in both ways, but I don't think that like it was necessarily done in here because for one thing, this this series has already has already made its mark because there was a pride flag. I think I believe in the last two games. I know for a fact it was in the yeah. Miles game. Yeah. I believe it was the last two games. I mean, you um, go to Greenwich Village, you're absolutely going to see the yeah, see that. Well, yeah, and it's and it's New York, you know. Yeah. Like like I don't know. I, like, like like much of this really is people just trying to get attention and kind of stir up the pot. There's, it's not actually fans do- talking about this. I think most fans who actually wouldn't like it kind of know to keep their mouth shut because that's just not the way that the history, that, that, that culture is going. So it's not really a controversy. It's it's an opportunity for people to make a YouTube video about it, but it's not really something that like the creators are going to be, are going to be skittish about going forward at, at all. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't surprised at it whatsoever. And I wasn't even like, I, I, I like it. I like how diverse the characters are. I like how it just kind of like like sticks his flag in the in the, the dirt and says this is what we're about. And I just feel that I just feel better about it. I don't want to play a Spider Man game where like you know gay people that's no good. I'd be like, <laughs> I, I, I spent five hundred dollars on this. Yeah. So. You know, like, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I was fine with it. Yeah. I do you recall this happening? This back. I, I hesitate to say backlash, but do you have? Do you recall this with the first one? I really don't. Um, okay. And what when would it have come up in the first one? I mean, the only thing I can imagine are people who just don't like Miles Morales. Even then, by that time, because I was the same year as Into the Spider Verse, yeah. So you wouldn't have heard that, yeah. Uh, or playing as Mary Jane, but I don't remember. And I remember people not liking the Mary Jane plots, but that's purely because of like the the lack of comparative action and less. There was more of that and less of like Mary Jane. That's a woman, I think. Like it was more of like. <laughs> Just the fact of that those are missions that you aren't Spider Man, and I never minded them on either game. That was also a thing too. People were like, I think even you even had su- surprised at like her character design in this. And I've seen people be really, really mean. And again, the actress had to come out and say that you know people are like harassing her over like the design, which I think is ridiculous because yeah. she just has her hair down. Yeah, I think they changed the nose slightly because it was it was certainly a, a bit of a redesign, not as much as Peter, which I've already complained about that uh, redesign. I pre- I like the original. After I had play- to get used to that. That took me a long time to actually. Yeah. Even though he was in the Miles Morales game, he wasn't in that much. Yeah. And he's a bit thicker in this game. But like, I genuinely every time because when he's Spider-Man, he sounds like Spider-Man. Yeah. It's, it's your own thoughts, the same voice actor. When he takes this mask off. He has he has those kind of smaller eyes and the different haircut. I'm like, this honestly is it's, it's it feels less right to me than the previous design. But you know, whatever. You genuinely can't continue to complain about it like so long after the fact. It, it is what it is. Yeah, you kind of have to get over it. I mean, and and when you're steeped in in a world for 20 hours, at some point you're going to let it go. And I think more things are important to you. And and that might be the lesson of this whole discussion here, just that, are you going to be dead set on something like you hate Miles's hair for some reason, or are you just going to like experience the story and how amazing it was? But I I think, you know, obviously people are going to be on social media if they want to be. Uh, I think we've had discussions about the toxicity of it, but I do just plea with others, you know, to enjoy something on your own and not let others kind of bug you down. Cause I think, I don't know if it's getting worse. I think it's getting louder. I hope it changes. Mm-hmm. But that whole thing could have ruined my experience of The Last of Us Part Two. But um, I mean, as it stands, it's still my favorite video game. And this one did not. As I said, I think the Haley level is honestly my favorite. A uh, close second might be the Black Cat level just because of the craziness yeah. you do with the, the portals. But I, w- I thought it was so original and fun how you are Haley. And because she doesn't speak um, she, really. She's deaf. Yes, she's deaf. And then, yeah, because a lot of our characters vocalize things. So, but she's not vocalizing, but you get to see her feelings by like little emojis that are happening. So she like walks across a plank and she's nervous. So you see that nervous emoji. And then just at the end where she um, recognizes that 
this person's not defacing walls, but is trying out art and then is upset and she speaks out to them. And there's like this coalition that they have. So you really get to know her. And boy, was I waiting for her and uh, Miles to get together. And finally they do at the end. But that that was honestly my favorite level. I, I really love Haley. So we well, have yeah, thing just real quick. Yes, please. Um, that, that there was a quote unquote backlash that I when I when I when I learned about it, I did kind of get it. I didn't have it really but like an, uh, on my own personally, but I, I understand it kind of in the last act of the game, Miles rocks up with a fo- whole new costume, mm-hmm. like a red, a, a black, red and blue costume. And he says, Oh, it's just time for a Miles Morales original. And people were like, we're, we're just really, they, they, they said that they didn't like the design. You know, I thought the design was like perfectly fine. It was, it wasn't any crazy than any of the other costumes, but what I understood when I learned was that like, it's an Adidas product tie in. Cause oh. he's wearing Adidas, Adidas shoes as opposed to his uh, trademark Jordans that he had, had been wearing and wore in the Spider-Verse movies. And like the general design, it was kind of like a, a marketing thing to kind of sell Adidas. And it is his his automatic costume for the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. And I think people just really reacted badly against that. I mean, coming out to like the design, that's, that's, that's a personal thing. But I do get how that is kind of a crass thing that interrupts the flow of the game. Yeah. When, especially if you do have a favorite costume that you want to play. So that... I, I still think that fanboy, fanboys don't know how to act like adults, but like I, I do, I will not combat that criticism as, okay, now this is, this is actively feeling unbelonging in my gaming experience. So, so that I understand the hair thing. Well, I, I saw pros and against when I was, when I was first shown because people think that, and, and I think now people feel that like people saw Killmonger and Black Panther and feel that that, that kind of, those kind of locks hairstyle is just kind of an auto. It's kind of like with Asian women and like dyed hair. People find it to be kind of like a, a less creative design choice for certain ki- people of color. I liked it. His hair's gotten better since every, in every game. Yeah. Uh, but th- that that costume, I was confused by it because like in the in the Miles game, he makes his own costume, and that's a big plot point. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know why he did that here. And and understanding the reason why, I was like, okay, that that is that is a little a little silly. I still didn't hate it, but like yeah. I understand people who, who didn't like that. But I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Do you feel like there's any is the hair thing the the negativity coming more from black audiences or white audiences i can't tell uh, okay. there's so many white people who pretend to be black people online um uh, there's a point <laughs> oh my God. There's a, there's, Who? that's uh, so weird no i believe you but that's so bizarre yes please there's a, there's a point in the in the game when you're doing with subtitles i think it's like at some sort of a community park or whatever he runs into the guy who says hey how, how are those locks treating you like he runs into the guy who did his hair yeah so it's not like he just like regenerated into that so i appreciate and it's also like i feel that like people who make those blanket statements just to kind of dis disregard folks who actually do have that hair yeah so i understand cre- uh, criticizing it as part of a whole but it's never measured okay and i don't and I, and I don't think and i think that like people have lost their taste for measured measured critiques in in too many arenas so it doesn't to me you you can think ah well you know most people do like his hair yeah but i think that um before too long it it loses its thing to talk about after a while i think yeah. I just wasn't sure if it was coming mainly from a white audience. I wasn't sure if it was basically um, subtle racism, uh, you know, thinking about in the professional world where a boss may say you can't have, you know, quote unquote, natural hair, that sort of thing. So I wasn't sure if they were like looking for something that's, I don't know, a cleaner cut than that. But I I really like his hair and I think it works well. I didn't that end costume. I didn't like that. I was like peeking out. But um, I got to like like the costume a little bit more because wasn't isn't it like a dome cut and so you can it's see like, his hair like at the end. Flash. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like ah, uh, but it, it did grow on me a little bit. But yeah, the product placement that's like I'm not sure about that. Okay, so we're gonna go into and talk about the story. My outline, I, I texted Don and I said this is the worst outline I've ever done, uh, just because I want this to be more of a conversation and similar to a required reading I, I recently did with Tom. I feel like it's more focused about the characters and and how the story evolves around them. So that's kind of how I've broken it up. But similar to the the first game, it is I would say three acts. And you can kind of base it around the villain where it's craven a little bit in act one, but then it's 
Craven Act Two plus the black suit, uh, which makes it more intense. And then Act Three is Venom, who is actually my my favorite Spider Man villain. Though I have a sweet spot for Shocker. Uh, <laughs> may he rest in oh, peace, because apparently he's also dead. But yeah, let's talk about Peter here and his character. So he has a lot of responsibilities. I think we can talk about his mentoring question mark of miles because that's a big story point the black suit how he changes and then uh i've i've added craven and wizard as kind of the two villains to talk about there but just what are your thoughts on peter and kind of how he evolved from the the first game and miles's game and where you see him and does he do a good job mentoring miles (laughs) i think it's fair to say that he does um up until harry shows up because I know that, like that was that was one of the constant constant text from you is that like he's treating Miles so bad. <laughs> That's intentional. I know. I, I started calling gonna... him Spider Jerk. Yeah, I'm not going to go on a Batman defense here. I think that that's meant because to... I I think Miles even calls him out at one point. So it's yeah. not like an accident. It's it's meant to be just just drama. I really enjoyed and I, and I will I will repeat this. And I think Marvel has has eventually gotten the, gotten the hint that this game takes the Peter Miles relationship better than it ever has been mm-hmm. in, in the comics. Like bar none like it, it actually makes me mad how much <laughs> they just like flippantly separated the two but i just I've, I've i've been a spider-man fan for like almost 30 years and i just don't see peter parker finding a, a kid who's around his age when he got bitten by a spider navigating his way to spider-man and just not being interested in him that just doesn't seem right to me so i love the i loved it in miles Morales, and i loved it here where like they're both in class and then miles is like in the bathroom can, can you help me? And they're both like, like, he's like, okay. And then like, both, they both run off the roof and suit up and, and attack the, the same. And I, I thought that that was all just like pure genius. And I think that like, I like how it is later on. where like, you know, they're a team, you know, Mary Jane knows him. And later on when Peter gets the black suit and he does actively act like an ass, yeah, like, like, like uh, he's chasing the lizard and, and he's like, we lost him. And, and Miles like, it's all good. I got, I got the checker right here. And he snatches, snatches it and then goes off alone. And then he tells Mary Jane, Miles blew it. He let us all down. It's like, <laughs> the reason why you're joking is because of him. That was so funny because it was, it, was, uh, it was hypocritical. It was hypocritical. That. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, he, he is nuts in the black suit. And it it's done well because it is like you see the dynamism it's not like oh he's fine and then he's insane you start to see his edges start to fray i was very upset when he was disrespectful to rio morales it's like you do not speak to the mayor in that way i really love this i think i think you hit every every point that i would that it's not just you know these two spider-man and they they're like in a work relationship but legitimately I would say brothers and family. And we already saw in the, in the miles game that obviously Peter trusts him with this responsibility because he was gone with Mary Jane to Sarkovia. Maybe they were. And so miles has, he's got New York for himself, but here it's, I love the first act in their relationship and especially yeah, facing off against Sandman because he lets miles do what he's got to do. He does, you know, he checks in on him, but he, he's not overbearing. And then he also takes time to educate him on certain things. So it's all Peter who comes up with kind of the sciencey way of how we're going to take down Sandman. So there are also like these wonderful teachable moments and some of my favorite moments which happens with multiple characters, but I think just in the beginning with you and Miles is that if you, are, well, you could be either, that which is another brilliant part where you can just switch characters midstream, which is amazing. But I love the mm-hmm. moments where you could be taking on one of the random crimes that happens. And then if the other person's in the area, they'll come down and start fighting with you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And just like, at, oh, yeah. you're just like all of a sudden co-oping with the other character. And at the end, you know, you can give them a, high five or give him a hug so i felt like yeah it's it's very beautiful obviously his mentoring does take a turn i feel it's not intentional i I think peter has an issue i mean you correct me if you if you think this is a mischaracterization but i feel like we know he juggles too much and i think it's just hard for him to manage and maybe like prioritize um and he feels like 
he chooses one thing in the moment that he feels like is the most important. And it, and when Harry comes back, like Harry is that thing. And unfortunately he's got to like push other things to the side, which happens to be miles, which is, it's really hard because miles calls him constantly. And then Harry calls and Peter's like, I have to call you back. Talks to Harry. Yeah. And then, then he's done with Harry. And so I think one time I did message you, I'm like, he just hung up with Harry. Why can't he call Miles back? So that's like a, a kind of a frustration. Do you feel like this is a character flaw that Peter has had throughout the comics where he will prioritize one thing to the detriment of other important things that he has on his plate? I think that that's a fair criticism. And that that, that is a fair look at Peter as a character who does naturally jiggle two things. And I actually think that that's a pretty shrewd observation that it's not like Miles is a psychic. I actually got a lot of like Tim Drake Robin vibes from it, from the comics, where Tim wasn't living at Wayne Manor and like, you know, he would have his own adventures, but he would work with Batman. So it's not like Miles is his ward. But I do think it's an interesting thing that like now that Harry's best friend's back in his life and he's healthy and all that kind of stuff, Peter just is naturally distracted. And that's not even a Spider Man thing, that's a Peter thing. And it's a f- character flaw, but it's not one that makes him a bad person. No. Uh, because there's still moments that I really, one of my favorite moments early on in the game is because the big thing that Miles has going on is, is Martin Lee is broken out of prison and they're trying to save some lives. And, and Miles is genuinely, and because Miles is a younger, less experienced Spider Man, he is distracted by that. So I like, first of all, I like it whenever Peter just says, Spider Man, like, like, like as Spider Man, I think it's really cool. But also, I personally don't think that this film or this film, this game <laughs> captures the exactly the wit of spider-man but i think what was a perfect spider-man moment was when miles is all down on himself and Sp- peter as spider-man tries to give him dap and he's like you know don't leave me hanging he's like i'm trying to sulk here not on my watch come on i was like that is perfect and i think that like even if peter messes up that's who he is and it's, it's a perfect contrast to how he is later on with the black suit right. that like this is spider-man and so I like. I actually like it more. It, it's it's like the kind. It's it's like those little character dynamics that are part of the people. Like one of my, probably my favorite bit from the first game was that whole texting cell phone conversation he had with Mary Jane. They're, they're kind of you know having some crossed communication there. This just feels like the people coming through rather than like you know going from mission to mission to mission. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you really get a sense of Peter's heart in in this game if you didn't already know it. Something that. I really saw in this game and I wonder, I feel like there's a tie, you know, I, I like to call him bat jerk, but I feel like there's a bit of a tie to Batman and I'd like to hear what you think uh, in terms of Spider-Man and, and his comic history. But Peter shows a lot of care and concern towards his villains and trying to help them out. Yes. In the moment, obviously he's joking around with them and making fun of them, but actively caring about Sandman. And I think it it comes through also when you're looking for those fragments and there's, depending on if you're Miles or Peter, you'll have commentary about it um, because he's concerned about his daughter. And Lizard, uh, Dr. Connors being concerned about that. Is this something that you would see in the comics as well that Peter has, well, Spider-Man, has a concern for, for the lives of the people? Because I feel like that's a very Batman thing where he does care about uh, the villains that he's going up against. I think with both characters, it is consistent enough that it is part of their character. At the same time, it's not always consistently shown. I I think that um, one of the commentaries uh, on this film, Spider-Man, is that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man would be that way where he would by the end he didn't want to just stab the villain in the heart like he even tried saving eddie brock right like like i think every villain he ultimately showed compassion to you know andrews did to an extent of those are those are written differently and i think with tom holland that's also shown consistently even the, even when it's kind of like kind of like fought against in, in no way home so i think that like it's in the last decade or so it's been more normalized than not that peter is more inclined to show compassion towards his villains. I think when he understands his villains' circumstances, like like, like with Philip Marco, he's he wants to help them. Like if he knows their circumstances, he's not going to ignore that. You know, he's never been that way with the Lizard. And knowing you know Philip Marco, and and I part of the reason why I didn't really mind that like Craven X'd off some of the villains is that like <laughs> as fun as they are, yeah, and as great as Spider Man's Rose Galleries are, if we're being completely honest, a lot of those guys don't really have personality. Like Shocker's never really had an emotional storyline. No. <laughs> um, Electro's never really had an emotional storyline. And so 
they kind of vary from version to version, which does not, which does not mean I dislike them. But you know, it's not like it's it's different than like Harvey Dent or Kirk Langstrom. So when you do see Spider Man extend that hand to characters like you know like Tombstone and stuff, that feels like that feels in character rather than the game feeling that he must just appear heroic. And so I think that it's not it's not like you know well he must be doing this kind of thing every time like like if if he's if he just punches somebody out makes a joke then leaves that seems fine to me. But when he did show compassion towards them, I was like well, yeah he is that kind of character he, and it feels like these. People who make these games are real Spider-Man fans. I would never question their pedigree. It feels like they really are familiar with the character in that way, and it strikes that strikes the right tone, uh, yeah. right chord. Absolutely, yeah. And and again, I think it serves well to contrast with what the character is like in the black suit, which is he's a rough guy. There, I should have worn my black black Spider-Man <laughs> uh, uh, shirt because I, I I can't wait to get to that part. Yeah, I loved. I mean, we can talk about it now. That is, it's one of my favorite suits in comics, and to have it in the game and the power that you have in that suit is just nuts. And they do such a great de- job design wise because as that act is continuing, it starts to shift more into the, you know, the Venom style that we're used to, which is matching his his personality. So, yeah. What are your thoughts? But I will say that Craven fight was really difficult because of the bell and Craven period. But, yeah, your uh, thoughts on the black suit. I mean, I will say that the costumes that you can get in any of these games are awesome. I, I wish you could just have many many missions after the game is done so you can keep switching them out because that, that's what i try to do but yeah thoughts on the black suit and symbiote spider-man well i think that because this game's spider-man uh suit is like the advanced suit right with the white spider yeah uh, which was which, which, that was the biggest controversy of the first game oh yeah going forward to, to have that design inform the black costume design is fine because it makes it, it makes it this version like I like that, and it's it's basically that suit, but it's just a bit more kind of like detailed in regards to that that costume. I loved it. I loved it. I love that, that every time you're in it, you can basically just destroy people. <laughs> I did the thing where you're just like swinging very very high. Now, I mean, I understand. Now, e- comic fans know that originally the suit didn't make him evil. They just kind of wore his body out like a battery. But it is a better idea that John Zipper and co- and company created in the in the '90s show that like it does make him darker. Because I just think that dark Peter Parker is just fun. I just think he's cool. I just think that like uh, I, I I liked it in the '90s show. I liked it. I liked it a lot in Spectacular Spider-Man. You know, it's definitely it's like the most amusing bit of Spider-Man three. And in here, my only my only complaint is that like I wish it was a little bit more gradual and also longer because uh, mm-hmm. it feels that like in in the, in the timeline of the game, he has a suit and kind of goes nuts and like from like Tuesday to Thursday, he's generally fine in this black suit. Gets annoyed during the whole lizard arc, and then. It's later on when, like, you know, he starts mouthing off to Harry and Mary Jane, which was delicious. And I just, I just enjoy pop some more pills. <laughs> Let's pop some more pills and see what you really feel. I thought that I even, I even kind of thought that, that was a, I want to say a cheat, but knowing that Harry, Harry, Harry Osborne has a has a drug problem in the comics, I kind of wish that was more of the comics rather than him being uh, sick. Because I would have mm-hmm. loved that. That would have been amazing. But uh, to me, this game. I feel that like I finally, 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 because I never, I've always enjoyed the black costume. I feel like I finally understand like, like this is such an awesome version of Spider Man. And I think what really sold it for me was a lot of the nighttime missions, mm-hmm. specifically the church part oh, where you're yeah. tracking down Craven and it's raining and it's dark and you learn about the whole weakness to Sonics and freak and uh, high pitch frequency and stuff like that. So, Right out of like they've clearly and there's a bit where like you know you go incognito inside the little Craven Mansion and learn of his backstory. This had this had one eye on Craven's last hunt, and I just think that like not enough Spider-Man media captures those really awesome J- James Dimatteis era Spider-Man comics where they were kind of really lean into Gothic storytelling. And I think it's just like the same way I felt in the first game that really nailed Spider-Man's relationship when he fights like criminals and like gangsters specifically, like cr- mob bosses. This one knows that Spider-Man is not just him fighting the Green Goblin every day. It's him in various tones. And that whole bit was like, I really feel like I'm playing a Spider-Man, like a true Spider-Man experience because it feels like this is something that he gets into now and then. And the darker he got, the more I think Yuri Lowenthal 
became eventually robbed of best performer because I loved his performance. He, was, he just screamed so many times. He couldn't stop screaming. And I love um him being trapped in the box when the like, Craven says, Look what I got. He has his miles and he's and like his suit just starts flipping out. And then like when he's like start, uh going after the henchman, he's like, What? <laughs> I just thought the entire time I was just like it's so awesome. I was I I I, I loved it. This is the most I've enjoyed Craven, and the most I've loved Symbiote Spider Man. I, I thought he, I thought he ruled. Yes, I. So I have many, yet yeah, many things to bring up that that you have sparked in what you were saying. I love the church. I I fell a lot of '90s Spider Man the animated series. You know, from that scene, I think that as well as Spider Man Three. There were moments where Peter was sleeping, and the symbiote is just doing whatever, and. Whether you like Mary Jane missions or not, that was awesome just because you are trying to sneak around and things are happening because like Spider-Man is sleeping and the symbiote is just destroying these people while you're sneaking around as Mary Jane. And, and I think you get a sense of like, oh gosh, this is because she has no idea what's going on. But I felt like that was really interesting to be not Spider-Man there, but someone watching on the outside of what this symbiote is doing. I, if if we hadn't known that Spider-Man was going to get the black suit, I would have thought that he got killed by Craven because I thought that's where we were going. I feel like maybe that's the end of Act One is is when Spider-Man is stabbed. I mean, that was a huge moment where he's fighting Craven or barely gets into it really and gets stabbed by Craven and then he breaks off the hilt and, and it's in there. And that's how that's the, awesome. Yeah, that's how the, the symbiote transfers over to Spider-Man. But yeah, so many amazing things. I was a little surprised because you and I know that the symbiote's vulnerabilities are are sonics and fire and so we had that kind of discussion about well this is interesting change but i think they had to make a decision because there were many number one you have the cult of the flame so it it would be hard i think to reason that he has that suit and is able to do all that with these flame people and then that whole uh tombstone or really um rescuing tombstone mission would have been very difficult as well Harry's really in the in the symbiote at that time but I think they just needed to to make a sacrifice and say okay it's just Sonics which I think it works out did you have any issues besides like an initial huh oh, what's going on there yeah the the, the, the Spider-Man fan pedigree of me was was like this is a time where like they really should be bringing up the weakness of fire and I thought that's not as much of a promoted weakness of the symbiotes but it is from the comics and then they and they know that but I think that you pick up a good point because they had that that subplot with the cult of the flame that, you know, it doesn't really matter, you know, and like, you know, do you want to, it's basically, do you want to play a simulator Spider-Man or not? And, yeah. I, and I get that, that that's, that's fine. If, if I felt less of like disdain for it or disrespect or any kind of disrespect and more of just like, you know, just kind of moving forward and what's, and what's plausible in regards to their, this version. And it is a different version. Like this version of Spider-Man showed up in Spider and across the Spider-Verse. So like, like uh, it's, it's, it's cool, but I'm glad that like, we both are talking about like, there are moments in this game where he really, they should be bringing that up. Especially because it is from outer space. Mm -hmm. but whatever, it's it's it it totally works. Yeah, I think with adaptations, I think you and I have probably learned this, you know, in our old age as we go to see more film adaptations of comics that we love, Birds of Prey, for example, that you kind of have to accept these changes as like this is, you know, it's a it's a choice. I mean, if you can't get over, I guess, the flame, then you really can't get over the fact that it's not Eddie Brock and as Venom, it's it's Harry Osborn. So I think you have to be able. You want to talk about that? <laughs> We you certainly do. You, do you want to do that now? Talk about that fact that it's not. Did that bother you? Did it bother you that it wasn't Eddie? I like you. Rock Venom is my favorite Spider-Man villain. He just is. Green Goblin is the best. Peter Parker villain. Doc Doc is the best Spider-Man villain. My favorite is Venom. And so I kind of took the whole Harry thing as, well, Harry is the better candidate for an enemy in regarding their relationship and all that stuff. And he did not really establish any Brock. So it works better. I don't like the argument that it works better. I get it for the game. Mm -hmm. I mean, it works better in regards to an enemy for Peter. I think that, like, as a character, Eddie Brock is Venom. It's not the symbiote that's called Venom that, like, the movie says. That's wrong. And I don't think that Venom is a legacy character that you can just, like, like just toss around the name towards. So, just flatly, I don't care for that decision. I understand it. And I, and I got past it. Like, I wasn't playing the game mad. But... I'm not going to sit here and say I really enjoyed this game, and because of that, I think that their take on Venom was the only choice and the right choice and the best choice and the only choice. Like, I, like no, I don't, I don't think that. 
that being said, I loved his presentation in the game. I think that like um this is clearly sort of its own mini Spider-Man sort of pseudo film universe. Mm -hmm. So they're melding a lot of things. Like the way they did Dr. Octopus was chiefly inspired by Spider-Man 2, the movie. And that's fine. That's th that's their version. And there's enough similarities between the comics and their own making up their own versions. But it's totally fine. You get that this is its own thing. Uh so that I totally accept. But I to me, it was like I still would have and specifically when they you know when they gave um harry like the flash thompson asian venom look it's a nice easter egg yeah like it's, it's cool so they know what they're doing and it's also weird that like you have in a little sticker mode and also the little um the frame selection specific quotes from eddie brock venom oh. and specific word balloons from asm 300 and asm 375 and all that kind of stuff so it's not like some executive made the decision so it, in that way, it, I I can let it sing if I if I want it to, I roll with it. Yeah. I'm not like saying like this is this is a con. It's not. I'm not saying it's a it's a con. It's just you know as a personal fan choice, I feel that they could have still pulled Eddie out because you know he um there's an Easter egg in the first game where you see like a letter of a good luck letter from the people in the Beagle and Eddie Brock's name is on there. But you know whatever like like you, you they're trying to do the best they can with all the different versions, so you roll with it. What did you feel about that? Yeah, I don't know that I would use any modifier with it, you know, better or best or anything. I think it is a choice. I don't know that we can necessarily compare because it's just a completely different experience. I was already, I feel like, trained for it to happen because of the end credit scene in the first game where yeah. Harry's in the tank. Oh, it looks like a civet. So it's probably going to be hairy. So I was kind of already expecting that. I do think it's an interesting angle because it's this game, I think, is really focused on love and loving relationships and, and the people surrounding Peter. So with Eddie, that's it's always been an antagonistic relationship between Peter and Eddie. And so obviously, yes, the symbiote is going to have harness that. Whereas what you know the question is what does it look like if the symbiote goes on somebody that there's like a strong and loving loving relationship with and and how would that change the dynamics as well as his goal which is you know a bit different because it's like it's a perverted goal of originally you know the the may what was it called what's her, what's his mother's name Emily May Foundation. Emily May Foundation, right? Because it's like, I want to heal the world. And it's like, well, maybe that's not the best way to go about it. Uh, so I feel like it's an interesting question. What if the symbiote uh, latches on to somebody after Peter that Peter loves and he loves equally? But yeah, so I personally was okay with it. I, I think I did text you once that um, once we see Harry with the symbiote fight with him for the first time, which was... Uh, the tombstone i was like isn't that flash thompson's <laughs> uh, yeah, kind no. of thing so I, I do like those little nods so they know what they're doing i think it would be bad if i was gonna say worse but really just bad if they were doing these things but didn't didn't like make a nod towards it like they were just pretending to ignore it so i think the fact that they are doing it but also owning that hey we know that this other thing exists i i appreciate that personally yeah, you know, yeah, I, I get, yeah. It's, it, it's some things. I just as a fan, I will say, you know, when when Harry says, "I'm not, I'm not Harry. We are Venom." It's like it's an Eddie Brock thing, but again, this is yeah. its own universe. Like, um, like the way that Aunt May dies is a very unique thing to itself. Yeah. So the way that Venom comes about, it's a very unique thing. There's also the thing that, like, um, there's not a lot of. I think we're talking about Harry, and right, right now, I, I forced this conversation. That, no, that's but uh, the like the Harry and Norman relationship is like the only kind of antipathy or acrimony there was one scene where Harry saw Norman hugging Peter, or whatever. Yep. And I feel that like traditionally there should there should be a lot more of that. Mm -hmm. Should you do more? Because Norman, you know, in the first game he was an antagonist of Martin Lee, so he's definitely you know a guy with, with sort of shady backgrounds. But he generally seems like a nice guy, in so far as he generally cares about Harry. Yeah. We're always up for debate in the comics. So they're definitely planning towards Norman in the third one. Yeah. Um, and I think that like this whole experience has made him made him a worse person by the end of it. But in my opinion, I, I would kind of I was kind of anticipating some sort of goblin element towards that. And they really kind of stuck with like the the his illness and the symbiote. And again, really, I'm not I'm not criticizing. Like that's something that I also don't really care for, is that like so many people since the game awards have come come out with their knives for this game in a way which I find to be 
um, illegitimate. Um, it's just on on a fan tip observations of you know zigs and zags. Uh, as I was in, in regards to the venom part, more more than anything else, really. Yeah, I guess I I do like that it takes a different path because everything was such a new experience for me because I wasn't sure what to expect. Whereas you know, read as you know, people who have been following Spider Man for a long time had this been you know, a copy and paste from the pages, we would have been like, oh, well, this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. But this was, yeah, shocking yeah. because there was a point where Norman seems to be creating gobule and green, even though it's not called that. <laughs> and I thought, oh, wow, what if Peter doesn't give him back the symbiote and it's actually like green goblin now versus Peter in the, in the symbiote, uh, which didn't happen, but I, I, I was interested to, to see what was going to happen. I did. I feel like that story beat you just mentioned. I wondered if they were going to build off this jealousy, but that, because that was the only time that we see that, I feel like you should have just thrown it, that away. Cause it didn't really do anything. There wasn't anything before that or after that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause it's not, it's not like Harry at any point. Is personally mad at Peter. I don't yeah. think. I mean, yeah. much of that. Much of that's. I mean, aside from something that's very natural and understandable, Peter won't give back the symbiote. Right, which is other, keeping, yeah. other than that. Yeah, for sure. I was surprised that Venom killed Craven, so we can talk about Craven and Venom there. I did, I love that. <laughs> I did like that Harry was still kind of separated from the symbiote because there is regret after that happened. So I did like that that story beat. Uh, but I was just not expecting that to happen. And uh, I think you and I joked about Craven very much saying yes. Wasn't he like super excited and kind of an erotic way that he was about to be killed? I think with Spider-Man, he at one point Spider-Man had my throat or whatever, or maybe or maybe like by a web or something. He was getting like 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 in a vice, and he was like, "Hi, <laughs> that's we what like, it was." Yeah. Hey, yo, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, we find out, which I guess I missed that particular story beat that Craven is dying of something. So this is why I want to replay it. But you find out later. But I guess I missed the point when you should have found out. I, I just found out via conversation. But he doesn't want to go this way. He like wants to be killed in a kind of in an arena sort of way by someone that that means something to him and uh we knew peter wasn't gonna do it but i was just shocked that i thought maybe he'd make it out but no venom venom's the one who did it <laughs> i thought craven was great but at the same time i found him to be really frustrating as a player he was very very, <laughs> very difficult and challenging yep. and even when you're finding the playing as venom he was tricky so when like venom just chomped up his head i was like no <laughs> screw him i hate him I, 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 again, I, again, I thought that was like gnarly. <laughs> yeah. Would you say this is the most dangerous version of Craven that you have seen? Oh, easily, easily, easily. More so than the comics. Like, like this is the most vicious. No, take no prisoners, Craven, and and he makes a lot more sense to me because mm -hmm. because in the comics he goes he like is created Spider Man, huh? I'll go for Spider Man. I think it makes more sense for him to kind of go after the, the totemic animal characters that you know, are kind of referenced as such in like the um, the JMS run. Like, you know, think about the people that you fight, like the Scorpion and the Rhino. But I don't think it's mentioned in this game. And other characters. Like, that actually made sense to me. Mm -hmm. But like, he wouldn't mean to go after Spider-Man to go after other characters. I mean, we see it in the trailer, but we don't know how that's going to play. Yeah. And I think if you want to be like, if you want to kind of stay in fanboy mode, could he really kill the Scorpion? Probably not. But at the same time, how great, how great fighters are these guys? Yeah. So I thought that that just like upped the stakes a bit. And... Because they had a really solid presentation in the first game, I was surprised, and I also was spoiling one of them too. But I didn't mind it because I thought that this, that just made it um, that, that just that just made it stand out. And I think that like we, we have all that in the game, and also him, as you mentioned, gutting Spider Man in the ribs and breaking off the yeah. the handle of the knife. I just thought that this 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 is a this is a villain that you, that you, that in many ways he's actually he's as scary as Venom, I think, and he's just a uh, a normal guy with like gas that he breathes in or whatever yeah no it was it was nuts i mean obviously you saw that that story trailer where he someone's hunting him and then he ends up taking care of him and we see all that the the first time i saw him in person as i was playing i'm like oh you hairy hairy man because he's like i mean he's just really out there he's very he's got all this machismo i think when he killed scorpion i think that was my like oh wow this is not 
this is not the craven that I think I've I've learned. And then yeah, when he stabs Spider Man, so it was he was intense. I would say that his fight as well as Lizards were the two that were the most difficult for me, but his, I think by far was the most, most difficult just because he has all these types of attacks. And then when the bell is going off, cause you're in the suit, you're having issues. You've got to stop the bell. And he's like coming after you is very frustrating, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, an amazing, yeah. an amazing villain to be sure. And then of course, um, all of his underlings that you have to fight throughout the city coming after you. Oh, uh, any thoughts on the lizard? We didn't talk about him at all. I mean, I remember in the first game that the lizard and the mysterious were referenced, but they, and I think maybe even Samuel was referenced, but they don't show up. Which I liked. I like that. I like that. Like, you know, it's not every villain that you see there. And so I liked it here, where you know he you get into it. All that bit was great. I like Spider Man investigating his, his house. You know, seeing that his his, his that Martha and took Billy away. That was great. I thought I liked him, how he was realized. He was pretty damn big. Um, I love the, the the chase across New York. That that was awesome. Those classic Spider-Man comics. Yeah. Love the fight in the sewer. This actually, because like this game actually was pretty glitchy for me, because when I beat Lizard in the middle of the cutscene, it just shut off. And I was worried I had to, I had to, I had to fight him again, but it got right back to the the, the cutscene. But I loved when like he beats him. Spider-Man's like, take your medicine. He takes a hypodermic and just like. Fix that thing up into his the roof of his mouth. I thought that was brutal. And then I like the, the explanation of how he lost his arm, which was that the, the symbiote ripped it off. Yes. Yeah. Or he ordered, yeah, them to shoot, which was yeah, an interesting yeah. change. Because of like the sixties, he was like a a, a combat oh, doctor, okay. and he lost it in the war. Gotcha. So gotcha. the idea is that like 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 I don't think we've ever seen it in a, in a flashback, but like it was like shot off or cut off or something like that during yeah. combat. Yeah. Um. It, it's attached to his arm, and so he orders one of the soldiers to shoot him off. I guess it was too soon to try anything else, but there you go. Uh, yes, he. I enjoyed seeing him. I, I think you get more of a sense of who Doc Connors is with Mary Jane, and because her story mission was really, she's the one who's trying to save him. So I think you get to see him a little bit more. Uh, and he's just holding back so much and he he's the go-to doctor for harry so that's kind of his big role but it's it's almost like this i don't know like an alcoholic or reformed drug addict kind of storyline because he's like really just don't do this to me and then they they feed him the stuff that he's been trying to to fight against actually very sad too to watch that Harry and mm-hmm. Peter's relationship. Do you think it was too too much broski, too much of a bromance, or did you enjoy it? No, I like it. I like I like moments. People might might not like it. Uh, I've seen people say, "Oh, now they're wasting my time." But I like moments where it's just <laughs> the life of Peter going through Aunt May's room and you know riding bikes with Harry. Like, I, in fact, I, I like it better than that kind of the challenges. I think it's kind of cool. I think it's kind of neat. Harry in the comics. I will admit that. If you actually look at the history of the comics, it's a little tricky for that he oh so he's his best friend because they're roommates rather than to me, I feel like Flash Thompson is closer to his best friend historically. But they've said it so many times that, that it's not. But in here, you know, it's nice to know that he was around. And they mentioned him a lot in the first game. Yeah. So that, that this this really justified a lot of that. I think the big thing I took away from was like at the end when, when they think he's gonna die, and Peter says, I love you. Yeah. I was like, I've definitely not seen that before. Yeah. Oh, uh, but again, that feels like if these kids were real, that that feels believable to me. So I enjoyed it. I really liked his theme. I don't know if you noticed, picked up on the theme, but it was a the theme that they played in the trailer at Comic Con. I just really liked that music touch, and it was always playing whenever he was around and when he was Venom. It was kind of a darker version of that theme, but I liked that a bit, and that just kind of made made this game much more fun and separate. And I think that like because you know if we were to take him as Venom, and the symbiote's kind of controlling his mind, the idea that like his mom died of an illness and he's dying of an illness. That justifies him having symbiotes take over the, the city. That, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. I think Harry is is tricky. I feel that like he's generally different in most every version of Spider-Man. And I mean like, you know, Spider-Man comics, Ultimate Spider-Man comics. I think maybe the closest to the original comics is probably the 90s show. Mm. And I'm not being biased. I'm just I'm just imagining that. Because I feel that like they he's either like the rich kid uh who's kind of aloof or genuinely Peter's friend. And I like that he here there there was no like sense of superiority. He really was Peter's friend from beginning to end. Like he got in that office and he thought about 
him and Aunt May and stuff like that. Like it, I I, ne I never got a sense of like malice or I'm tricking you or I don't mean what I say or I'm jealous because I'm Mary Jane. He he felt like really real, while also not being the same character. So like um, I thought he was it was a really solid version of him. I'm not, I don't know if anybody who said that that Harry Osborn is their favorite character, but um, if we're going to adapt the Spider-Man mythos, I thought he was a solid take on the character. What did you think? Yeah, I agree. And I think they did a good job of showing not telling how close they are because I think there are two flashback levels, both of which you get to see little nerdy Peter Parker with the round glasses. Yes. But, you know, like slipping through the school to get a, I can't remember what it was. It was for a science fair that they had. And I think they needed backup files or something like that. Um, but just to yeah. see like what they're like, and then you flash forward and they're, they had broken into a school again, but they're adults and just hanging out and shooting basketball. Uh, so seeing that development and seeing how close they are and, and with Mary Jane too, I, yeah, I thought it was a, a nice touch to be sure. I once Harry led Peter through the foundation and had that office, I thought, oh, wow, is this like, is Peter going to have a happy ending where he's going to kind of give up or retire as Spider-Man, give it to Miles and be in this, in this space and, and doing science that he loves for, for a good cause. And so one of the heartbreaks, honestly, was when that foundation was destroyed, <laughs> Because yeah, I thought, boy, man, it? is there not? Because it was, it's, it was such a beautiful dream, of, you know, the two of them having a reunion and then looking back to their mother figures and then also trying to to put it forward and and help people, and then to have that be destroyed and like both of their futures kind of in limbo again uh, was really quite sad. I was also, I think that was one of the times that I teared up. There was another time once we get to uh, Miles. I thought he was going to die again. And I thought, not again. Poor Peter has already lost Aunt May, but he's, I guess, comatose. Who knows if he'll wake up in the in the third game. But to have that moment, yeah. And, and we don't see, I think, in media very often men saying, I love you to other men in a non-erotic fashion. And so I thought that was a, a very <laughs> bold choice. Well, I mean, because I think yeah. with toxic masculinity, you know, men can't say that. Um, so to have that, I thought was just a, a really beautiful moment. Yeah, it's great. and I and I agree that like I think it's better that that he that and it makes sense that because Miles is there with his electric powers that he that he does live. It mm -hmm. actually made sense rather than feel like a cop out. And I like the fact that he did live because it, because otherwise you would just be repeating the the great ending from the first game. Yeah. So I thought that was the right way to go about it, and also gives Norman, you know, anger to kind of go on. Yeah. Uh, not that Harry is dead, but like you know, Harry went through this whole thing and through this whole science experiment, and he ended up in a coma. Like like that, I thought that was pitch perfect like that really was well thought out first I, I really liked how he ended up tragic yes but totally logical from the, the whole universe of the story absolutely so now we'll move on to miles and by the end of the game miles it is clear now that he is going to be our lead in the third game he's taking over all of new york so everything is sort of built up to this so thoughts on his development i guess across three games and then my big question for you is do you think miles is going to have trouble balancing the responsibilities like peter has or do you think that I hope he, he does. will have learned <laughs> you hope he does is that what you said okay yeah. <laughs> Well, also that was another thing that like people, you know, th that started the. I mean, when I say people, I mean, I don't, I don't really think that these people are are honestly fans who are upset. Like, I feel that like there's a difference between people who are upset about the the Spider Man marriage, and then people who are upset at all the diversity. While some may converge, there's there's definitely a personality type or the other. And people were saying, when 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 Insomniac said Miles will be the main Spider Man for the for the for the foreseeable for the next game at least, yeah. like, Miles is not Spider Man. Peter Parker is Spider-Man. Miles Morales is Miles Morales. And so there was a whole thing on, on, online for that. Whatever. I liked Miles in this game quite a bit. I, I also like the fact that like much of his side plots were, were generally more pleasant and sunnier compared to Peter's yeah. stuff, which I think made a little bit more sense. You know, and also helped balance the tone of the game. It's not just dark, 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 dark. But I feel that like that like this game is darker than the first one, which I like. The first one was pretty intense. I enjoy how uh donkeys uh incorporated here as well mm -hmm. I, have a, I, I don't know how i feel i guess i'm okay with it that like so many people in his inner circle know who he is yeah because i like secret i like secret entities i like the conflict i like this i like the, the potential for dramatic i guess 
people see secret identities as kind of like an old timey trope now, primarily, but like I've always enjoyed them. So it's odd for me that like uh Gonki and his mom and Haley. Yeah. Um, and his and his uncle all know who he is. It feels like 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 he doesn't really have to struggle too much about that. But whatever. I enjoyed how how things went for him. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed how his storyline was with Martin Lee. That was a great storyline. Oh yeah. With him oh, yeah. And, and Mr. Negative. And and a great thing. You know, Peter has his personal story with Harry. Miles has his with Martin Lee kind of moving on. And I think that he really enhances his role as Spider Man by going through that. The whole like, you know, like the guy who shot Uncle Ben was was arrested that night. You know, Miles, yes, uh, Martin Lee was arrested by Spider Man, but with him out, what's he going to do? Mm -hmm. And I thought that, that that had a great story potential for him that might have been kind of swallowed up a bit by the Sims storyline if I think about it. Like it feels like it, it did kind of come every now and then. Yeah. But it was okay. And I think that the way it ends with him and, and, and Martin Lee. Is really powerful. Mm -hmm. I really think that that's, that's that's powerful stuff, and this makes Miles feel older, like naturally, without just kind of being kind of maturing too soon. I think people are worried that he's maybe too too overpowered. But I, thought, I liked how both him and Peter have their own set of abilities, and I, I never really uh, disliked playing either of them compared to the other. So I think he's great, and I really with I I feel that this year or okay sorry last year twenty twenty three was the year of Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. Between Across the Spider Verse and this game, he really has been solidified as a premier Spider Man in a way I don't know if there's any other legacy character, of which he is, yeah. that can compare. Quite frankly, I don't think there's any because because I've seen children, plenty of children separately, very young, and their initial introduction introduction to Spider Man is Miles Morales, and that's when they get into. And I've seen older fans who know Spider Man and this like, like Miles Morales. So I think this, this game does him very very well. What about what about you? Because I, I don't know what else to say more than just like just, yeah, just general satisfaction. Positive with accolades. Yeah. I, I wonder how much money Brian Michael Bendis and Sarah Pacelli bring in. <laughs> oh, especially with yeah, now that all that changed because initially people weren't getting money for legacy characters and things like that. But yes, I I loved Miles in this game. I'm really glad that. The trajectory of his character that you get to know him as just miles in the first one you see that tragedy he's got his powers at the end then he has his own kind of smaller game where you get to to see him without peter because i think that's important that he has his own distinct character and then here i do what i understand what you're saying about secret identity because it does seem like everybody and, and their mother knows about uh, these people but i'm glad that he has a support system that he can ask yeah you've got genki on the tech side and then Haley also comes through and, and he's able to to talk with her as well the martin lee I would say is, yeah, one of the best parts of this game, starting with them having to go to the raft. It was a raft, right? Or was it a, were they? Oh, um, yeah, I think so. Yeah. And uh, it's sinking. And Miles has that moment of hesitation where he's like, maybe I should just let him die. Like really strong character moments. The fact that his powers and, and Mr. Negative's powers merge, which is just like, probably awful for the person who killed your father to have that physical influence over you. And then by the end where they have to work together and he kind of, well, first they have that fight and he has to make a decision about like, what's the best for this fight? Cause he's about to go after him. And within that fight being very psychological, cause Martin Lee's kind of like, he doesn't know who he is initially. And then he gets down to it and, and sees, you know, what, why Miles hates him so much and who Miles is. Uh, but them working together and that moment before the climax of that fight, where he says, this was the other moment that I teared up. I can't forgive you. I don't have it in me, but I have to like, I have to let it go though. Cause it'll just like eat him up, which I thought was very powerful. I've, I've spoken about forgiveness um, on this podcast before and, and sometimes you just can't. So it, it was, I felt like it was 
very powerful, uh, per perhaps one of maybe more powerful than what was going on uh, with Peters, because Peters is like very action and, and very intense. But this one was like emotional story beats, I think. I do worry about him as the lead. Not that I, I, I he's definitely capable. I don't think that's what it is um, in regards to the overpowered. I think that maybe might be compensated by the fact that he is young and still somewhat inexperienced. So I think there might be a balance with that. So he won't seem terribly overpowered. But I do, you know, he's already struggled with carrying too much. His mother had that conversation with him as well. There was a weird moment, which when I replay it out, I'll, I'll probably think about it again, where he says like, what does he say? Something about like, I've, I've chosen the more important things. And I was like, I don't think that's what she told you to do. It was, I, I can't yeah. remember it properly, but just, I just worry about that. Cause he did not have the best model in Peter to, you know, balance things. And so I'm like, well, now we have this guy who probably barely got his application in to where he wanted to go to school. Now he's got all of this other stuff on his plate. So that is my only concern with him being the lead, but but I'm sure it'll make for for great story moments. I, I, yeah, I think that like I'm looking forward to the supporting characters as well. Yeah. You know, with Spider-Man, uh, you had Black Cat, and I think at one point Silver Sable. I don't think, which, 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 it's fine, but I don't, think, I don't think she's mentioned at all in this game. And with Miles, by the third act of that game, in some regards, for Peter to show up again. I think that, like, you know, it wouldn't just be Miles, Miles, Miles throughout the entire time. In terms of, like, the, the breadth of the, the city, saving the city, I think that, mm -hmm. like, not to do him down as a hero at all, but just, you know, the breadth of characters that they have at their disposal to kind of augment the experience. That's, so that's what I anticipate. And there's also a lot of different ways they could go. I think they've referenced whether they had plans to it or they're, if they're still doing it, some sort of multiversal thing. Mm -hmm. Especially in regards to once you get off the spider bots. We'll see how right. where, that, where that tangent goes towards. Yeah. It'll be interesting. So I guess our, our last character, I don't want to leave her out there. I, I feel like her story might have been the weakest, uh, but Mary Jane, I feel like a lot of it has to do with where her place is kind of in the professional world and, and just in her life. And she takes the the story beat of the consternation between, you know, a reporter and JJJ from Peter. So now it's like her dealing with, with those mm -hmm. issues any thoughts on this now of course there's that terrible meme that has come out or or a little video image which i never even thought about um in terms of venom but at one point yes you do have to fight mary jane because <laughs> the symbiote was put upon her uh was she shriek what was her symbiote oh name? scream scream okay I, that i didn't was i was not spoiled for that i thought that was awesome yeah that was so cool I i've not, not seen scream it? since separation anxiety <laughs> Oh man, but thoughts thoughts on Mary Jane. She had a couple missions. I mean, did you think her story was as strong as the the first game? I remember when I first played when I played the first game and Mary Jane's introduced, which was just a surprise in the game, and I showed Denmark. He really rolled his eyes at the he, he thought that they were just like completely sidestepping the whole model backstory, and he thought that that was lame. And it did make me kind of think, and I, I wonder what the impetus is for that, because for her to kind of be this sort of reporter does feel derivative for a superhero girlfriend to do but i like her in the game mm -hmm. i think she's well written i don't think she's ever been a damsel in distress to a believable degree i think that like she has a lot of agency while we've never had that whole i'm mad at peter thing and, you know beyond not beyond reason i don't know I, like, I, I never really had a problem with it i feel like like it's not something for me to have a problem with. I don't like Mary Jane when she's kind of used against Spider-Man in, in various media. And that primary, and when I say Mary, I really mean the comics. Like, oh man, she's at this other guy. Or she has her own power. She doesn't need Spider-Man. I feel that that's, that's, that's when it, to me, it feels like shallow effort. Where here, you know, Mary Jane is, is, is the love of Spider-Man's life. That's just, that's just how it is, fanboys. Uh, I say fanboys, you know, boomers. So I think she's fine how she's being done here. I, I really don't have an issue. I think that like her wearing a yellow sweater was a nod to the '90s show, which they definitely have the in, in cases because you have the that one shade of the black costume and like the, the blue and red design, which I thought was great. Yeah. No, I mean I I don't even I don't even really mind the Mary Jane issues or a uh, a uh, 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 side plots and storylines or the Mary Jane challenges essentially. That's never bothered me. I don't know. Like 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 I just I just don't really have a problem with her presentation, nor do I feel like I should. I like the whole thing from the comics, but you know, if this is something doing something different, it's fine for what it is. So 
Did that did I love it as much as the other stuff? Well, I mean, no, because I don't play as her as much, but yeah. She's cool. I mean, I, th I thought she was fine. I thought she was yeah. fine. If someone wants to say, now let's talk about like the, the problem of the game, which is Mary Jane Watson. I would fight them on that because it doesn't, it, it just did not register that way to me. Yeah, I don't think it is. I, I think I enjoy her presentation and her story more uh, in the first one. But um, I think, yeah, I, I have no problems, I would say, with, uh, with her story beats. I, I think it shows that she's trying to figure out her life. Um, she might be less of a partner than she is in the first game but by the end i think that's just other forces that are happening but by the end you know they're really together and and we'll see what that looks like i did find it amusing as someone who is currently recording a podcast that she records a podcast and immediately publishes it and i'm like lady I know. you didn't make <laughs> any mistakes you don't have to edit it at all well good for you mary jane well, the intro music what, what about yeah the spot i know that was hysterical and i think at this point everyone's like that, that was almost like a joke because there's so many podcasts out there now. It's like, wait, what was that? Like, 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 you, you know, there was no that background noise. You didn't, yeah. your cell phone didn't go off. She was like, "This is Mary Jane Watson and safe <laughs> published." Don't do that. Take it off. Oh man, awesome. yeah, it was funny how she yeah went up to against uh, J Jonah Jameson, whereas we're we used we're used to uh, Peter being the person who's having issues with that. Guy. I loved his first appearance in the game. That was great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Where Miles calls him, he's like, "You'll never believe who I am." And then he's swinging through the city, shouting that he's kidnapped. Yeah, I miss that guy. I do. I, I enjoy those little podcasts that pop in. Unfortunately, you can't replay them. Uh, which in the previous game you could pick them up. So there are sometimes I would just stand there waiting for it to end because if you went into any sort of combat, it would immediately cut off, which was a bit of a bummer. But anything else on Mary Jane or the characters? No, really. I think, that, I think that's that's fine. I think that like the 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 motion actress had some sort of like a uh, uh, facial surgery, like in regards to an, an injury. So that might have been providing a difference between the first and second design. I don't. Oh, okay. I, she looked the same character to me. Like, yeah. like I think that just, it was just a difference of hair. I didn't notice any facial difference. But that is the reason if you if you if you picked it up. But I just you know whatever. I just I just hate the people who decide to make their personality to, to like you know dislike her that way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, side missions, anything you want to talk about? Uh, we have the Sandman side missions where you are tracking down pieces of his uh, being to a certain, or his heart, um, and you get some backstory with him. We also have uh, Cult of the Flame, and I'll also connect Wraith to that, those side missions. And we have the one where there's a person who, oh, the chameleon side mission. That was a shock. I was not expecting that. Uh, oh. Where you, yeah, you are tracking down. There's uh, these bots that you have to chase down by flying in their slipstream. And it's people on hit lists. And then you realize it's one person. And it's chameleon. And I'm trying to think. What other side? Oh, the Mysteriums. That was yeah, the Mysterio enough. one. Yeah, because you think that Mysterio is the evil person, but it's actually his uh, his <laughs> associates. So yeah, thoughts on any of those, and and which one or ones were your favorites? I pretty much all those was I did after after I beat the main story. I will say that I think my favorite one is the Cult of the Flame one with the ring because that was that felt like a DLC. Yeah, that was just straight up another storyline. And followed up from the first game with the raid, which was built very well over the DLC. I absolutely adored the first game's DLC. It was just like playing just, just this. It was like to me, it felt like uh, the next volume of, of a trade paperback in a Spider-Man story. It's a, a whole other thing. And this one was a great follow-up. I I play as a black costume, um, so it just looked cooler with a, with a more tense storyline. And I loved the reveal of Ooh. who the cult leader was. Yeah, and I just thought. The whole thing was was just brilliant. So in terms of the 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 whole subplot side quest, that was probably my favorite. But the flying bird one, I had the hardest time with because I really couldn't properly steer into the slipstream. The, the controls were just tricky for me, so I had to really really work hard to kind of like like get used to that and then beat those. But when I did beat it, and the whole thing where you go into the penthouse and hear this this narration and stuff and the gas. I thought that was that was like my favorite thrill of the game because like when it's like first of all it makes bazillion sense as the chameleon yeah that makes total sense but yep. the presentation was cool too and just seeing Spider-Man from afar in the pot house and swing away 
I was just so excited. I was, and of course, I was in Black Awesome as well. It felt like, it felt like 80s Spider Man. I just thought yeah. it was so cool. It, love it. So I, was, I would, <laughs> I enjoyed all of them. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, like, uh, the Cult of the Flame ger- in general, I enjoyed the ending reveal. Once you finish the Flying Birds with the whole Chameleon Pinhead thing, that one was my favorite. That one I just thought was like 150 percent awesome that was i love that but what about yourself yeah the the camille i didn't see that coming i agree with you it totally makes sense but i was just like why am i in this penthouse what's going to happen and then as it like as you progress deeper within and all of this is coming out and you're like oh my gosh because i i think Camille was a kingpin a... yeah oh that would have oh wow yeah, that would have been shocking too. But because I think the chameleon is a pretty cool villain. So that yeah. that was great. I I wasn't sure. Like the cold of the flame, I'm like, what's going on? Because in the game, you encounter some people doing like burning sacrifices to citizens early on. And I'm like, yeah. what's going on here? Cause I think you're as Miles when you may first encounter one of these. And even he's like, what was that a cult? And I thought, Oh, what's good. What's going to be going on with this. And then it gets like worse and worse. Spider-Man keeps getting called the fool's beacon. So I'm thought getting, trying to think about what's going on. Wraith is nuts. You have to fight Wraith unnecessarily because uh. <laughs> there's always that, you know, heroes fighting heroes. And then at the end where like it was all leading up to him hijacking an Oscorp train and getting some symbiote and one of his aliases is Cletus Cassie. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so do you think... Do you think we'll get DLC? Do you think a Carnage subplot would be a good DLC, or do you think it's enough to be in a third game? Uh, well, let me think about this because I'm trying to think about how the, the pattern was in the first game. Because in the first game, Black Cat clues were littered throughout the game, and she was the first DLC. So they they they, they, they led up to that and they followed up with that pretty quickly. In this one, you know, you have skins for Venom and Spider Man and Scream. And technically, Miles, if you're in the costume. Yeah. And then you have, you know, the Cleus Cassie design. So they could do a DLC with Carnage. That would, that would make sense. I wonder, though, here's the thing, though. So, like, in the deals, so, like, we are getting DLC. That's not a presumption, right? I don't know. I know that now it's that New Game now. Plus. Yeah. Because, like, between this and the next game, like, we'll, we'll, we'll only Miles be in the DLC. That'll be interesting. Because, because I played I with Peter, it. that, that, yeah. that subplot. Um, I think you have to. Yeah, yeah yeah so like we'll i think it might depend on that uh whether the reality of the dlc or how it will be in, in the other game oh gosh i'm i, I don't even, i don't even know because i'm trying to think of something they would have set up for the dlc because there's a lot of sub games honestly like you know in regards to the mysterio and all that kind of stuff so but i mean like you know hammerhead wasn't in the main game that was a totally the whole dlc thing so yeah remember it was it was black cat it was Yuri and Hammerhead, and then Silver Sable and Hammer Hammerhead again. I actually, I'm actually yeah. forgetting because I remember playing against Hammerhead in like one of them. I forget because 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 Silver Sable wasn't the, the final boss. She joined your side. So I'm trying I'm trying to remember the events of that, but um, that's neither here nor there. I'm sorry. I don't know. I really don't know. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, I just wonder if there's anything you want to see. Well, of course, unfortunately, I should say, of course, and unfortunately, there was a leak because hackers and being terrible with uh, with video game companies. But obviously, the Wolverine, that new upcoming film um, yeah. game, apparently there were no DLC was leaked, but upcoming releases, including Marvel's Venom in 2025. I don't know if that'll be. Uh, you only played him as a, as, as him like twice. Or, yeah, I don't know if it'll be a Harry or a Flash. Who knows? Spider Man three in twenty twenty eight, uh, Ratchet and Clank in twenty twenty nine, and and Marvel's X Men in twenty thirty. Yeah, we do know obviously that there's going to be a new game plus, but nothing mentioned about. So maybe no DLCs. I don't know. Yeah, because I feel like a Carnage would be a good DLC rather than taking place um, over the the extent of the whole next game. But we, I mean, with Doc Ock appearing at the very end and having his own plan. I mean, what are your thoughts on what the Octopus is up to? Oh, you know, I've, I've actually not thought too much about that because you you have the Seas of Norman and yeah. the Cleese yep. Cassie thing and the Chameleon. So that's actually a good point. I actually haven't, haven't thought about what Doc Ock could be, could be up to. Because he's got to play a huge part. He was such a gigantic part of the first game. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Because like, like, he hated Norman Osborn 
in the first game. Like he, that was one of the things he kidnapped him. Yeah. So it's interesting. Norman Osborn and, and, and Otto Octavius don't have a long history, even though it feels that they that they should. And it actually feels right that they should. Like, I like that they did in No Way Home. So, like, I don't know how they could do it. I feel like that, that's just, that would be something they would have to kind of conjure up and write themselves. Mm-hmm. I can't really say going off of much what they would do. Because last we saw that Doc Ock hated Norman, but Norman was the one talking to him at the end. He's like, oh, you know who Spider-Man is. He's like, he's like wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> yeah. But um, and We've already done Sinister Six, so it'd have to be something really big to top that yeah that's true and i don't think they're gonna i don't think they're gonna do like superior spider-man because i feel that like that's that's that will take like a bigger build-up so i yeah. i am totally unsure at this moment yeah, it's gonna happen uh yeah well i guess we can look forward to carnage and green goblin and then we'll we'll see Chameleon. what happens so the final thing i do want to say for this finale game another post credits which i did not expect whatsoever i was waiting because we rio tells us that she has a date so he's going to come and i'm like okay who is this going to be the guys who who even cares who he is but the person with him his daughter is cindy moon aka silk so thoughts on that is that just another thing with spider-verse because that could be huge (gasps) oh what if doc ock knows about the alternate and he brings in all these doc docs that'd be interesting but cindy moon is that just a tie and and like of more universes or do you think she will kind of be the next spider person and miles will be the mentor to to her well that's cool it's funny i felt a little embarrassed because josh was like i can't wait for you to, to sit through the credits so sit through the credits was like 25 minutes <laughs> and after, by the end you see miles and Haley and they kiss and then rio invites her date in with his daughter i don't know if they ever she ever said her date's last name because this is my daughter cindy and i'm like who who is that and josh like are you serious uh, cindy i said cindy moon i said so i was like oh <laughs> so like because they didn't say moon i just didn't figure it like, do we do we see her face like i just thought it was, it was like a girl from the back but like um she might have obviously it has to be yeah like 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 there's no other cindy in the spider-man I, unless it's like some sort of like bronze age girlfriend but um <laughs> she could they could do a legacy thing kind of because she seemed young like yeah. cindy moon i believe is peter's age traditionally but like uh they could do that. I mean, I'm down. I'm not really followed Silk in the comics too much, but I, think, I do think that she has a killer design. Like her her costume looks amazing. So I would be totally for a kind of like Miles training Cindy or that kind of like history repeating itself plot line there. That would be dope. And I mean, honestly, it's odd because I feel that like ten years ago I may have felt differently. I like a lot of the Spider characters. Mm-hmm. I like Peter. I like Miles. I like Spider Gwen. You know, Hobie, Spider Punk. Um, I've always liked Miguel. Still, so, so like none of this feels. Um, all of this feels like yeah, totally. Bring them all in. Bring them all yeah. in. And we referenced it again, but like one of the subplot or one of the side quests was getting all the spider bots that are around the, the city for the Easter eggs. And what you do, there is like a sort of a boom tube that yeah. uh, references the Spider Verse. And Insomniac said that they're doing something with the Spider Verse, which would be pretty neat. I don't know. I mean, my brother and I have talked about like you know what do with that the clone saga because you know you have a bunch of ben oh, riley costumes yeah. yeah you have my you have miguel's costume but he but he actually is out there it's not just an alternate so like really they could do anything they want really because they didn't, they didn't have the black suit in the first game because they were clearly blowing up to the next one right they also don't didn't have never had uh ben riley spider-man slash spider-girl suit which i love so those kinds of absences lend itself to being followed up on in later iterations. Yeah. But as as far as as far as Silk goes, I'm all for Silk because I think that she's a cool character, and I think that like this this game series has done right by all characters not named Eddie Brock. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah, a lot of the the Spider Bots, uh, kind of. Well, not kind of, but they reference other characters or ones that you might expect like different spider women or spider girls so it is interesting uh whether they're they're building up to something which i feel like yeah insomniac does not they didn't, do i don't think there was a silk spider bot though they had a spider gwen one they had a spider girl one but i don't yeah. think they had a silk one i'm not sure i'd have to go back my favorite there are many cute ones if they made little merchandise of that i would get it but I, probably my favorite one is a j jonah jameson spider bot complete with the mustache and and the yeah. <laughs> i 
I mean, when I got it, I was like, that's the cutest little thing. Oh, man. Yeah. No, I just, uh, you know, we, this nation is going through it. Uh, we, we both have our own personal problems, uh, but this is definitely a game that I sat down and was just like, thoroughly immersed and enjoying myself and and it brought me joy even in times of distress when I would voice chat you and say what is spider jerk doing how dare he respect disrespect uh Mayor Morales but yes so I I highly recommend this game to uh to anybody yeah me too uh if this game hadn't come out when it did force me to get PS5 I obviously would have gotten a PS5 because um Final Fantasy Rebirth is coming out next month (laughs) <laughs> uh, so I will, I will do it eventually, but like, um, uh, it worked out when I got it. Like, you know, I didn't get it immediately, but when I got it, I, I like it wasn't too deep of an expense. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Like, I think the the gaming experience, I definitely liked the first game more, but I really like the world of this game, and I enjoy playing it. it just, I just, once I've beaten everything, I'm just like just chilling. I can like listen to podcasts and just like webbing around, beating people up, like uh. <laughs> It's it's uh it's fun and I I have very little ask when it comes to this game. I think that like um uh it still has my favorite element, which is to take pictures. I I love doing that. I love mm. kind of you know taking because I feel that like as a comic book fan, you just love the splash artwork, and this one honors so much of the original comic books that to understand that that fans love just great shots that just gives you hours and hours and hours of, of enjoyment and learning how to do it the best and um with the with the with the different costumes and such. It's it's just uh. I might play it again when we get off this recording. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the photos I sent you, which, you know, say what you will about X Twitter. Uh, I do. I am sad. I understand why they did it and good for them. But the fact that PlayStation disconnected the, the chance to uh, share photos, I do. I do mourn that loss. But I think one image I found because I was just swinging through and there's like a, a graffitied image of a baby jjj in a diaper with a cigar and i was like i'm gonna send this to donna so, <laughs> any fun moments with yeah J. Jonah Jameson. well any final thoughts i i really like this game yeah. uh you're like like, like, like a, a nine out of ten at, at, at best because i know I, I know that like i had a much more cohesive uh game experience the first one so so because of that i, I might be missing some things it's, it's not as it wasn't it wasn't as, a, as a, the exact same experience but i still really love it and I'm looking forward to the next one. Even though I understand that, like that, like Brian Itahar came mm-hmm. out and said that, like ultimately they they were kind of rushed on it. Mm-hmm. And so, 2028, they can take as much time as they need to, yeah. uh, to refine it if they want if they want to. I'm not mad at it whatsoever. Uh, I still have this to play, and and I really I really I really enjoy it. And I feel that like because I never really played the Arkham games. I have Arkham Asylum. Mm-hmm. I didn't get very far into it just. Because of, I got distracted when I was when I, with my PS3, so I don't have that that gaming experience. This is definitely my fanboy gaming experience that I I, I uh, uh, cherish going through again. Yeah. yeah, I wonder, did he explain why he was rushed? Is it because of a fear of hackers or just they like, said that pressure like, put it out? There was there was a key quote. I was, I'm not seeing the entire interview, and he actually was kind of speaking in vagaries, but like uh, like basically that like the back half of the game. I think once Harry is Venom, it's implied that like the resolution. Like they basically they kind of they kind of rushed to speed it up and he kind of regretted that. I think it's definitely like the latter half rather than like kind of lead up to it. Gotcha. Um I should I should look at it again and send it send that interview to you. But um I I do enjoy it. I mean choices were made, but like I'm 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 not like, you know, crossing my arms at it. I, I as a as a as a professional Spider Man fan, I, I this yeah. this this gets an A for me. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, when the PlayStation five came out the question was like, how long can I wait? And which game was going to be the one to kind of push me over? And I figured it was either going to be this or a Naughty Dog game. And so I'm not mad that it's this. Again, thank you to my mysterious benefactor. But yeah, well, well worth it for sure. And yeah, like I said, I love it. I think I, I second you that um, the first game, I might like it slightly more, but I, I don't, I'm not going to complain about any of the stuff that goes down here. And I'm looking forward to seeing what three looks like. And I hope I get to play more as Haley. Every time like Haley popped up, I was like, oh, Haley. I just think she's the cutest. Um, and I appreciate her activism and can't wait to see more shipping between those two. So that was something that brought joy to my life. 
But uh, yes. Okay. So Donovan and I are going to take a break and we come back. We're going to talk about birds of prey. So I guess if you've waited an hour and a half, now you can fast forward to all that. Birds of prey number five. But first, Zias's radio hour featuring Burning, which is also the theme song of Echo by Yeah, Yeah, Yes. See you soon. Welcome back. So this is the first time I've had, I think, a co-host on to talk about this Birds of Prey series. So we are doing Birds of Prey number five, Megadeth part five, writer Kelly Thompson, art and colors by Ariste Dane, I'm going to guess. And the publisher synopsis, because I'm, I'm still lazy, can the birds and the Amazon save sin? As the birds and the Amazons double their efforts in fighting Megara, Dinah and Sin take the battle inside, quite literally. The battle for the fate of Sin has now truly begun, and it is not something everyone is gonna walk away from. 
Donovan. You caught up on this. I know that you read the first one, the first issue, because um, I made a crack about uh, Harley almost taking Cassandra out <laughs> with a fish because <laughs> I found that amusing, but you did not. But what are your thoughts leading up to this issue? What have you thought about this series? Yes, actually, I read the first issue because I had, I had a uh, review copy because I was inter uh, interviewing Kelly Thompson uh, about it. I really enjoy it. Okay, I'm not I'm not. I've been reading Birds of Prey on and off since the Infancy 2, which is a sad thing to say. But, and I'm actually not terribly familiar with Kelly Compton. I know that she's done a lot of Marvel work. I believe she worked on Captain Marvel, right? Yes. Carol Danvers. Um, so this is my first exposure to her. Yeah, sure. And right away, to me, she just feels like a real fan of these characters in the DC world. And I overall enjoyed issue one, and I've really liked everything leading up to here. Um, I think she has a great respect for Cassandra Kane, which is important. Um, I like how all the characters are rendered. I'm liking, see, I'm liking Big Barda. I'm not, I've not read a lot of comics with Big Barda in them. I like, I've always liked the character. Dinah is great, and I loved everything with Wonder Woman in the last couple of issues. I love Green Arrow just sweating bullets the entire time. Like, I'm sorry, Diana. Please don't punch me too hard. Oh, well, Diana just rocks up and like just, just like just knocks him around, and he's like, I'm just trying to be a distraction. And then she goes over there, and then she just has this, this awesome full face splash at the end. Barda's trying to do her best, and she like 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 has her over her knee, and then Diana just Diana just kind of gets up off the floor and just just like knocks her out in one punch. And then Cassandra does her best, and it broke my heart. Then like she like just just blows Cassandra back. I mean, I knew it was coming, <laughs> but that splash page. I got to that page. I was like, no. So I I have. Really, really love this series because I think I think it's it's like comic it's like pure like pure comic book reading experience. I mean, I I will say that like I do think, and maybe it's just because of her presence that I think like when 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 King Shark first showed up, I was like, okay, is this just, is this just some sort of like backdoor you know advertisement for the Harley Quinn show? Because uh -huh. I think Harley's presence as sort of like the loud mouth of the team it was annoying me. I'm not saying that like Kelly Thompson was writing her wrong. I was just saying like just her being here, I was like, I want her to be actually be quiet. Mm -hmm. But the characters also say the same thing. And so I was okay with it in the succeeding issues. But when King Shark showed up, I was like, this feels like advertisement. And I'm not, I, I didn't, I wasn't quick to follow up on it. I was going to be on here. I made sure to read the rest of it. And I love those issues. So I, I, I am digging this, this book um, almost as much as I'm digging um, more than Nightwing right now. And also uh, uh, World's Finest, which I've really liked. Another solid uh, DC book right now. I'm glad to hear it. Would you read a team-up book between Big Barda and Cass. Of course. I read anything that Cassandra's in. Uh, I, I, I got around to reading Deceased eventually. So, like, you know, she shows up, but she's not ruined. Then I'll, then I'll read it. Yeah. I, I in, That is, like, the most shocking partnership that I would never have come up with. But I just enjoy how those two interact. I love how Big Barda calls Cass little, little bat. And they can yeah chat about fighting and things like that it's just i would love to have like a buddy cop uh issue with with them or not an issue but yeah a whole series or like a little mini or something so then mm -hmm. we get to five and i'm just wondering if you feel like this feels completely different than the first four issues that we were reading yeah because the art is worse worse well that's a weird i mean it you well, you don't like it as much as the initial art. No, I love Romero's artwork. Romero uh, agree, right away yeah. has a kind of like um, <clears throat> classic, very sublime, dynamic, artistic style that I thought worked well. And then like I opened this issue up in all respect to uh, the artist here. But I'm like, why is everybody having eyeshadow? You know, <laughs> why does everybody have the exact same body type? Why is it? Everybody not having as as expressive, you know, facial expressions. You know, it this this to me looked a lot more like when people think of like comic artists drawing women, they think of this. Mm. Rather than Romero just drawing the characters in a very like you know, kind of grounded but also very like dynamic comic book way. Like I thought that they really had a real team here, and I honestly am crossing my fingers that Romero just had like the flu one month and and couldn't do the issue because yeah. like. When you have certain runs like Bruno Redondo on Nightwing or Dan Mora on World's Finest, those are runs. You know, the team up with Ken Taylor and Mark Wade, that's that's like an iconic team up. I thought we had something with Kelly Thompson and is it Leo Romero? Am I getting that right? Yeah, Leonardo Romero, yep. Yeah. So I was I was like, Yeah, this this is another solid DC team. 
immediately for me, I don't like the artwork. I just, I just think that like when you, it's not even so much like I am an uh, allergic to artists having a more puerile take on the female form than other artists. Yeah. But compared to, in my opinion, a master like Romero, I just thought it was like, like, like you could have gotten like uh Michael Cho or Jordan Gibson. And it would be different, but kind of be in the same vein. But this this is such a jarring change that it immediately, to my opinion, and this might sound mean, but it hurt the book because it, the change was so, so jarring. Yeah. Um, through uh, artistically, first and foremost. Yeah, because this, I just did not care for it as much as one through four. And like each each month that this has been coming in after one, I'm so excited to read it and I love it. And they're like so close to getting perfect tens. Um, but this one, I'm like, oh man, what has happened? And and I think maybe part of it is that I wouldn't say that it's bad. It, it reminds me, I've got right now the first page open, which when I opened this for the first time that I read it, I was like, why do I have to look? at Dinah's crotch. Um, so on page one, it's like directly up, but that's the eye goes there, man. Even the squint test, that's where it is. So that was frustrating. Their faces all look pretty similar. There's a bit of a Benna's kind of face in there, but they also reminded yeah. me of that line of statues, which I can't remember what it's called, but like very particular um, style that all the characters kind of have the same face kind of reminds me of that. But I also felt like the, I don't know, the tone shifted or just the sense of danger kind of shifted for me. And it didn't seem like the heightened sense of awareness of like, oh, this is going to be really bad at the end of the previous issue didn't really carry over here. So I just felt like something, something happened I, for, for one point let's see here when sin gets pulled away into these threads here dinah completely shuts down as if yeah. sin is dead and i thought to myself that is not dinah at all like she's just completely shut down and other people have to say hey you know like she's probably still okay my the my idea of dinah is like she would have run right into it after sin uh, did you have any, I mean, this is just like one beat, but did you have any issues with this that she's just like, sin's gone, we failed, that's it? It was like a moment, I think what took me away from it was that like Harley's the one to like snap her out of it. <laughs> and it's, and it's like, you know, she's joking around and then she's like, like being serious and she hits her yep. and then she's like, well, Harley's right. And I just, I just, I just don't need this book to advertise Harley Quinn. Like I just, I just don't need to be sold on Harley Quinn here and again i'm not saying that like that's not against harley that's not harley's character but she's so popular right now at dc that is difficult like, i remember one time where, like where batman did was turn to harley day um and that's fine I'm, I'm not i'm not i don't i don't hate harley quinn but i don't i'm not always on board with the constant promotion of her just because i feel that like it's just it's it's i don't know it, 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 it's, it's not as uh effective to me as other characters and i think that every other character here with the exception of Zealot, in as far as much as I'm just not familiar with Zealot, yeah, um, I just have much more of an affinity towards, and I feel that like maybe Cass, who is of a similar age, or Barda, who is you know as experienced as as, as Dinah, would have been sooner to do that. I mean, I guess I guess the scene here is that they're fighting these like Megadeth vines and stuff, so they're they're distracted, like they have to turn around to notice that and Harley do that. Well, Harley is the one towards her, so yeah. I guess it's set up that way, but. I don't know. Like, like, like. It feels like like Harley has a big scene every issue, and one of the big sort of like when Sandra was announced to be in the BUP, I was like, "Yay!" It was Harley Quinn. I was like, "No!" <laughs> and this is not exactly what I was expecting, but at the same time, it's, it was kind of like that part of that no that like I just don't want everything to have like kind the kind of poochiness about it, right? It, mm -hmm. it, it, when Harley's on on panel, everyone should be asking, "Where's Harley?" Like, you know, even if they're kind of saying we don't like her, that's still kind of like promoting her as like this sort of like wild card. Yeah. And it's not bad writing, but it is sort of a vibe that I feel makes the story feel less organic mm. um, as as a as a reader of a particular kind. Yeah, I guess it seems like in every issue, Harley kind of comes through in an unexpected way to help out. So it's a lot of like, let's prove that Harley 
can be on this team, um, whether that's to readers maybe, or also to Dinah, I think. In this moment, I think Harley's being Harley, so we can probably agree that that fits the character, but I think it, the moment shouldn't have happened at all because I just feel like Dinah would not have felt like she lost sin. She would have just run in there. So I think that's my my greater issue. Inside is an interesting, I mean, what do you think about this conversation uh, we find out that Megara is, has all these threads of people's lifelines, but not, uh, I'll use a gender neutral pronoun, not their own. And so is going to take over Sin's life. And my big question was, well, why Sin? And then we find out, well, Sin kind of summoned uh, Megara because uh, Sin wanted to be strong and a hero type like Dinah. But I mean, I look around and I think, sin i mean you got cassandra dinah just has this one power um why do you need to be super powered so what do you think about the conceit of why megara is here and that sin has summoned them or her personally for me it's it's i'm a bit of a loss because i really am not familiar with sin at all okay. uh i've not read stories where she showed up before in, in the original birds of prey run i kind of thought she was younger than 16 is, is that right when we first met her, but I guess we've aged up, which means your dear Cass might be an actual adult. I mean, Cass she should be an adult. Be drink. Like, she, can <laughs> she drink? I mean, she was 17 when she first was created. I know that they've done that down since, but like, whatever. <laughs> but like, I mean, like, um, I will say that like, that like when she's kind of explaining things, like it, it was some sort of sort of malicious and waha, it was me the entire time. It was just like, this is just kind of my feelings about that. Okay. But I'm, I want to, I want to copy that with, like, I'm not, really familiar with her so i wasn't really okay. when you said oh did you buy it i was like i have no choice <laughs> <She's still laughs> no choice should. yeah yeah i guess it's just interesting when some i mean a 16 year old i feel like that's more of a 12 year old who would say i want to be powerful but as a 16 year old i i would just look around and think about all the normal humans that are superheroes and why why can't she be that way uh i guess when you get down to it you know, this arc has really much been this relationship between Dinah and Sin. Um, and so Dinah's trying to find a way to Sin, and Sin, in a way, is trying to find her way to Dinah, but just in, a, in another capacity. I will say, writing-wise, to nitpick, I feel like the Megara's voice changed because it was very formal, and then it started, or it became informal like i'm just looking at this page right here and dinah saying oh god it's even weirder inside her than looking at it from the outside and megara says rude and later on there's a, a bubble where megara uses like kind of in a in a california e-way and i'm not sure where that decision came from but i i i didn't like it as much but you know i don't know that i necessarily have as many points to bring up uh, on this one as I normally do. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what six is and if we get back to um, the dream team that we've encountered. As a MAPS fan, we're fellow MAPS fans, uh, what do you think about MAPS? Uh, what, do you ha what have you thought about MAPS in this current story and then her place in this issue? It's weird because it's like, such a different version that it's hard to kind of yeah. reconcile the two. I know. Have they... <laughs> Have they, have they have they flat out explained how she came to be this way? No, I, I think just that she's, I believe, from the future. Sure. So that's all we know. Yeah, I'm I'm I'm, I'm not saying this isn't Maps um, Mizuguchi, but like it's <laughs> yeah. just it's because like she's still like a kid. Like, even like, even in the Batgirl storyline, she's not a hero yet. Yeah. She even had like a backup story in like Batman Black and White where she was a sort of pseudo Robin, but she's not really been on a path to costume heroism. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like that's Brady Brant. She's Galactus kind of thing. It's it's like it, it's like you, you can say that, but it's hard yeah. for me to like you know see that as this is now Mass Mizuguchi. This is just this is a time displaced variant of her essentially. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I imagine. I wish there were more moments between her and Cass, just because we remember in back roles that they had kind of that one quasi adventure. But I, I think maybe Thompson is doing what uh, you know a good writer does: seeding many questions so that uh, she can pull 
pull those threads um, through for the future arcs. So I feel like if this arc is mostly focused on Donna and Sin's relationship, then um, we were dropping different things about Zealot, for instance, and about uh, Maps as Meridian. And then hopefully Thompson will carry that through and answer our questions in future arcs. That's what I imagine. Because otherwise it'd be a lot of info dumping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's fine. Um, I like how I like how she has these little asides. Like, crap, this felt less scary in my head. So she's yeah. she is recognizably maps in that way. She's yeah. not like Miss, Miss Stoic or whatever. It's yeah. it's good. But there's a there's a lot there's a lot of stuff happening. You know, the plan yeah. and getting into the mascara and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So maps's inclusion is kind of like when she shows up, it's like, oh yeah, she's here in in a way. Yeah. I I don't want her to be abused as a deus ex machina where she kind of because right now it seems like she kind of is that way where at these like intense moments she pops up and so she's able to help out. So I hope that that is used sparingly. That would be my only mm -hmm. concern. But yes. Any other thoughts on this issue? I think Amazon's have been presented because I feel that like um, as tricky as it is to get in, and of course the the big things they don't want to alert Diana, but this is like, that like they've generally survived these fights with these Amazons fairly successfully, and yes, they are superheroes. I mean, it's not like these are like, these are nobodies getting the drop on them, but um, I am surprised that, like that some, in some of these scenes the Amazons are kind of rendered as just sort of like you know like kind of like NPC henchmen from a video game rather than the Amazons who are meant to be like the best fighters on the planet. Yeah. And so it, it, I kind of go back and forth because sometimes I say, well, it's Cassandra Kane. It's like Barda. Like these are guys are people who are trained to fight, you know, as, as much as, as long as they have been. But in other ways, I'm like, you know, I, I like, like, like I, if I think about Harley Quinn beating the Amazon, my, my, my nose is going to bleed. But like, uh, uh, it is, I, I am wondering how, how, what the difficulty level should be or the, they just kind of need the plot to go along. Well, Harley did beat Cassandra with a fish. She didn't beat her. Does Cassandra say that she beat me? She distracted you her with a fish. <laughs> she distracted her with a fish. And then I think some other things happened. I wish I had the issue now. Oh, and then and, I think some other things happened. Yeah, I think a bookcase fell and it was a distraction. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying. It was close That's not what I asked combat. you. <laughs> Man. Donovan goes from zero to irate in, in less than a millisecond whenever you talk about dear Cassandra in less than glowing terms, I have to say. So, but I would say that I talked pretty well about her. Yeah. Any, any other thoughts? I feel bad that I don't have much to say about Well, I mean, like, 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 like did, did, did it not come across to you? I'm just asking like about the Amazons. Like, did they? Oh, the it, Amazons. In I, regards, like, should they be easy to, 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 not easy, but like, you know, What's the difficulty level in fighting them? I would say that it should be high difficulty. If the, I can kind of agree with you about um, Harley. Um, I probably more agree than disagree. The only thing I would say, I mean, Cass, Big Barda, I think because Zealot is a big question mark for us, it speaks more to her prowess than it does, I think, the weakness of the Amazons. I'm trying to say, of course, she's hacking and slashing and she made that. I don't know how they're living. This middle panel, she has cut somebody in half, but she made that whole pact that she can't be killed and she can't kill somebody else. So I don't know what exactly is happening right there in that panel. Uh, but Zealot is, is, as I say, for every episode. Um, um, the big question mark for me. So I would say yes, I, but perhaps it's the previous issue is more realistic in the fact that they were able to take down the birds and imprison them with the exception of Cass. But here it seems like- I like that, yeah, yeah. Just, you didn't even see it. It was just like, like, like yeah. next page, they're all in jail. Yeah, so- who knows? So I would say yes and no. I mean, I guess plot-wise, we gotta, we gotta stop fighting them at some point. But they're all under the control of the, the Megara or Megara, yeah. I don't know. I yeah, I agree with you. I'll just go with that. Are you okay with that? No, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm even like 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 salty about it. I'm just like because as I, I was I was thinking, I was like, well, these are very very capable women, mm -hmm. and they've been talking the entire time about how anxiety drenched this mission is. But then we get scenes of them just like you know like we gotta do this, we gotta do that. Like they're talking like as they're kind of fighting the the Amazons. Yeah. And I'm thinking, I I think it, it just it just kind of plays out differently than than. How how I would like to imagine it. Yeah, and I'm not I'm trying to be, I'm not trying to be critical much, or I'm not trying to uh, 
to say a word against it. I'm, I'm just th those are thoughts that come into my head as as they kind of come on because it because these kinds of these kind of storylines where we have a mission we got to do this mission get all these people yeah. here for the mission stuff just happens sometimes to kind of kind of bring the plot along and the realities of the mission that they talked so much about dip in difficulty uh, as the pages go on and that's with a lot of comics that's that's not unique to this uh it also you know it, it depends because like and it's funny because like you know like we mentioned in the last issue uh when maps disappeared they got immediately arrested so i mean that's not really a complaint i should lo lobby that against because we saw how it went the other way in the previous issue so yeah and I, i'm wondering about this publisher synopsis because it makes it seem like the birds of prey and the amazons are working together uh, so I don't know if that's an issue with the solicitation or that was a plan and then the plan changed because clearly the Amazons are still against the birds of prey. So I, yeah, I don't yeah. know so, how. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure if something happened to warrant a change, but yeah, no, it is interesting that uh, they were in jail and now uh, it looks like Zealot is the only one fighting against multiple Amazons. So yeah, you do wonder, I guess it, there's an inconsistency, I guess. Is one person able to take down multiple or is it tough for multiple birds to face multiple Amazons? So I, I can call your, your inconsistency. I, I see what you're saying. Any other thoughts on issue five? I just think that I just am not big a fan of this artist as I am Leo Romero. Leo Romero's artwork was not only like really awesome and fun to look at, but also very really clean yeah. in his storytelling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, they kind of find like a big monster as well as all these other different kinds of people. Yeah. Storytelling just becomes, like, just becomes a lot less clear. Yeah. And when characters' facial expressions don't kind of react, don't map to the situation at hand, it it it, it, it muddies the reading experience. It's uh, I really want I really want Leo Romero to come back, please. <laughs> yeah. So fingers crossed, fingers crossed. This was just, it was just a blip. It was just a blip and issue six, we'll get back to it. And uh, yeah, we'll love Bad it. issue, but just, just not like, like the previous issues, I'd be like, uh, why shouldn't I give this a 10? I mean, those, these, those issues were, I was like, this is so cool. Yeah, I yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah. This, this is comics. And this one's just like, it's a thing that happened. Yeah. And it was so weird that I thought, am I in a bad mood? <laughs> And I was like, no, it's not me. Because sometimes like my mood will affect how I receive a comic. But I reread it again this morning in preparation for this. And I was like, no, I'm, I still feel the same way. But uh, but I still trust Thompson. Okay, well, what would you give this out of 10 birds? I really can't say much against against the writing. Mm -hmm. I didn't care for the artwork too much. I mean, the artwork's not out and out bad. Just the style I don't really care for it. So I'll give it, I think, a an average seven out of ten. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll raise you a bit, and and because just generally I'm more positive. Uh, I'll give it a seven point five out of ten. Yeah, the only nitpick about the writing is just I think I I saw that informality creep in, which I wasn't sure why that was happening, um, unless she's already sucking the life force out of sin and and is deciding to talk like a 16 year old but even sin doesn't really talk like that so i don't know um yeah art wise i would say it's not bad but i agree with you that i was just looking at that where uh zealot is saying like how do we take him down and like she has like a puckered puckered lips and it was just like that doesn't that looks like to me, something to me it was the makeup it was the, it was yeah. the eye <laughs> This looks like a like a like a, a cover artist for or something. I don't know. They're all like hinge profile uh, pictures. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. Okay. Well, we shall move on. Uh, I just have one listener email. Mail time. Mail time. The mail's here. Come on. Here's the mail, it never fails. It makes me want to wag my tail. When it comes, I want to wail. Did you read Nightwing? I did not read Nightwing, sadly. Yeah, I thought, oh, should I? Because my, um, my woman crush is on there. But no, I'm behind. I think I have yet to read the pirate arc. So I need to read all of that and then catch up. Though I did see the cover where Damien is a cat. And he's going to push something off of. <laughs> yeah, his, like he's he's called cat. Mr. Mittens. Oh, I'm excited for it. Yeah, so I need to I need to get back to that for sure. 
So this comes from uh, Earth to Shana regarding Back Row the Oracle number 241. Hi, Stella. Happy 14th anniversary. Hands down, my favorite scene from issue number four was Cass freeing the birds from the prison cell. I laughed out loud at Donna's verbal realization. Were you even in here? I can't tell at this point which member of the team I like best. Honestly, every character feels so unique and full. I appreciate appreciate each of them for different reasons i don't know how thompson is doing it but i hope she doesn't stop i think some of the magic comes from being able to tactfully weave personal moments into the high stakes and action scenes whether it's harley making a quip in the middle of battle or dinah caring for barda in the prison cell it all just helps bring the characters and story to life it's great knowing that Barbara will be making an appearance in a couple of issues. It's unfortunate that some fans take out all their frustrations on writers. As you mentioned, they don't always have the final say in their stories. And when being a writer is your livelihood, it isn't so simple to rebel and walk away, even if it is what you want to do. Not much else to say on Birds of Prey, except that I cannot wait for the next issue and to see how this arc closes. Here are a few of my favorites from 2023. Anime, uh, Jujutsu Kaisen Season 2. Comic. oh god <laughs> i don't know <laughs> that's interesting that you have that reaction I, no i saw, I saw season two was it, was it was it was brutal it was a brutal season <laughs> oh dear uh comic birds of prey by kelly thompson no surprise music artist noah khan who did stick season and i think called drunk or drunk call so i have heard of him book alone together why we expect more from technology and less from each other didn't come out this year but i read it this year i don't think i read any books that came out in 2023 favorite thing i learned how to play richie mahjong and finally on chairman alexi i was not aware of his opinions about me too good to know happy new year i hope you achieve everything you want in 2024 thank you shana so i do want to yes be clear about uh sherman alexi i was kind of hemming and hawing hedging my language right. because i did not have with me the evidence and I have this now annoying quality of demanding evidence from people, which I think I actually recommend that you start doing this, people, not in like little things, but when someone tells you something and it seems like it could be important, I think that we should ask evidence. So if it's like a dietary, like blah, blah is bad for you, I would ask just because there's a lot of misinformation going around. Donovan and I have talked about misinformation in the dating world, which I think it has already become and, and will continue to be like very toxic and damaging to people in particular, I think women. Uh, so just in case I just couldn't give you specifics because I didn't have anything pulled up because I didn't know that uh, Shana was going to mention Sherman Alexi, but he was accused. This article is just from 2018 in a very Harvey Weinstein sort of way. He used his power and uh, popularity as a writer to target other people. And so these women have come forth, unfortunately, like even more unfortunate than just women. Uh, they were of the indigenous population because they looked up to him um, as an indigenous person uh, and writer. And so he would fawn over, this is just an example, but he would fawn over people's writing. Uh, a poet talks about that and another writer. And then he would do certain things. And uh, one woman was quoted as saying like, you know, I thought that he liked my writing, but it was just, he wanted to have sex with me. So you can find this article if you choose to. Uh, but this is just a reason why um, I choose not to, you know, promote his writing or I just have the freedom to choose whether or not I want to uh, to read somebody's work. And so I'm, I'm going to say no. Uh, unfortunately for me, uh, I became a bit of a hypocrite, though unknowingly because the next line, unfortunately, because uh, sometimes I like to be a hypocrite. I'm just kidding. Uh, on the next required reading, I chose Carol, also known as The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith, and recommended it. I had already read it once. Tom and I are getting, we're getting ready. I do my um, kind of history of the author in the book, and then I find a, a subsection in her biography about religious and political beliefs. And within that, uh, you know, I'm reading, oh, she's an atheist. I'm like, okay. And then it goes down and she an avowed anti-Semite and so I'm oh, reading this wow. and I'm like <sighs> and like it has quotes of hers and stuff and so it's too late I've already said we're doing this show Tom and I have already read the book 
we're recording in a few hours. So that is an unfortunate thing where I, you know, gave uh, an author a platform, but Tom and I had that discussion. I bring it up on the, on the episode. Cause I didn't want to, I mean, it needs to be aired. I think now I've come to the realization, like my own personal responsibility, not only being a podcaster, but I think personally that I guess I, I should start doing background informational checks and biographical checks on authors before I read them. I mean, he even mentioned, Tom mentioned, you know, that's not, that's the reason why I'm not going to read Ender's Game because Orson Scott Card is a, has said homophobic things. And I'm like, oh my gosh, someone gave me Ender's oh, yeah. Game. I was thinking about using that as a, you know, a thing. So I think it's just, um, especially because of our literature podcast, but me who, who really doesn't want to engage with that and has a difficulty separating or divorcing the work from the author um, to kind of start doing that. But I, I you know, I, I mean, obviously Highsmith is dead now. So who knows where that money is going, but I would caution you at least to do some research. Cause I just think about this person who I'm sure you heard of this. Well, I brought it up to you and I think Harry did as well. I can't remember her name, which is probably okay. But now if someone asks for evidence, I can't give you it who had a, I think a movie deal already at, but her book had yet to be published and she creates fake accounts and starts review bombing other oh, author yeah, debuts, yeah, yeah, yeah. and these authors are minorities and then this whole thing it just gets out of control but i'm just like i would prefer to know that about somebody and not support their work rather than yeah just blindly going so all that to say uh that about truman alexi and then i do apologize about patricia highsmith yes okay any thoughts on that? Do you have any thoughts about death of the author? Do you, are you able to divorce an author and their political views or social views or history from the work that they produce? I don't think you and I have ever I think talked it, about this. We've talked about that before on the show. And I think, I think it, it, it kind of depends. Like I, like, like I think Chuck Dixon will go down as uh, one of the all-time great comic writers, DC writers, and especially Batman writers, like his work is just so foundational to how we enjoy these 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 um these characters. Um, not that he's like done anything bad, but like you know his politics are like are, I think are 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 pretty forbidden, uh, mm -hmm. not just conservative. And I know that like I've had disagreements with other folks. Like I ever when, when Kanye West was going on his rampage last year, I was asking Denmark, you know, do you think you'll ever listen to his music again? He was like, well, sure, I'll listen to his music again, whatever I want. But that, that doesn't that doesn't automatically mean endorsement. Yeah. So um, it kind of does depend on person and, and particularly what their status does represent. That was interesting because I was listening to you talk about Sherman Lexi yesterday, and I did not I was not aware of him because I, I we have our books at his store. I was not aware of him and all the all those things going on. So I thought that was an interesting discussion, especially because he's a modern writer. Yeah. And Patricia Highsmith, I've read um, the talented Mr. Ripley. Yeah, and I'm aware of her as an author. I've seen the movie Carol. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that she was an anti-Semite either. So, in many ways, you know, especially when it comes to people who were dead, you, you can't really blame yourself for knowing that. Like, yeah. you know, people can have bad reactions to that. It's, it's, it depends on how you carry yourself with as much knowledge as you do have going forward. I think. Yeah. So it depends. Yeah, and I guess it's just like I, I think you make a misstep or you learn something and then it's how you react after you learn that thing. So I remember going to Cracker Barrel and I got a, a Grogu calendar and I took a picture and sent it to Carolyn Coke. And I was like, I got this from Cracker Barrel. And she said, you know about Cracker Barrel's policies, right? And I'm like, no. And so then, you know, I found out about the go to Cracker Barrel all the time. <laughs> well, maybe you need to look up their policies. I think it's gotten better. Um, but they had like some, some anti, I yeah, I don't want to misspeak again. I'll hedge my language, but it seemed like it was some, some anti-queer, um, uh, employment thing. I, I, so, I, I think my dad was, was, uh, aware of that whole lawsuit. And we talked about it like years ago because they have, they have a, the one that's near our house. We have, they have a sign that says, we welcome everybody. Please don't, don't not come in. Um, so it's not been, not <laughs> been a problem for us, but like, I, th in. yeah, I think they, uh, they kind of like, you know, buried the lead with that, that. The name of the restaurant. That's neither here nor there. Oh, uh, Cracker Barrel. Okay. Well, enough of that. Uh, are you reading anything? Anything that Stella gave you uh, by Naomi Alderman? Not her new book, but another book? <laughs> I will be soon. <laughs> oh, big deal. I will be soon. That's uh -huh. that. Well, my, my New Year's resolution is to read more. 
So that that is more likely than not. I am reading a book that you got me for Christmas. <gasps> Psychology. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, okay. I've been reading that set. I've been reading it every single day. I did leave it at the store uh, when we, we left this closed the store early, and I've not been back since. As a matter of fact, I got a text in between our recordings saying, "Is this book yours?" I was like, "Yes, it's mine. Please don't, please don't shelve it." But if I may. Reading that book has led to a very fun two-parter, which I'm proud of us doing over at Questions We Don't Have Answers. So, Psychology, a book by the mononymic author Vern, is about the the Steven, the filmography of Steven Seagal, um, action Hollywood celebrity and, and terrible person. Talk about so separating the um, the death of the author. It's yeah. another topic. So, I was reading the book, and um, it talks about the film that he did called The Patriot. In which there is a cameo appearance by his real life daughter, Ayoko Fujitani. He, he married uh, in the late or mid mid seventies in, in Japan. When he lived in Japan, he had a daughter, and whose whose mother he divorced in the mid eighties. But she uh, in 1998 was a cameo in his film, in a film in which he, he plays a very doting father, which is very interesting to read. And so, oh, so she has a daughter. So I looked her up. She has her own film career and writing career completely separated from him which is very interesting and one of the first things that she did was a movie two years later uh in japan which was inspired by her time filming uh the patriot in la with seems Gall, about a movie about a woman who's experienced extreme emotional distress and, and ptsd and trauma with her family <laughs> and so harry and i were fascinated by this 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 anecdote so we did a commentary and it had a discussion on the film the patriot on questions we don't have answers and we went over to Harriet, uh, to Harriet, Harry's uh, own site and podcast with Eyes East. Watched, we watched um, the film Shikijitsu or Ritual, as it can be called, and had a, we had a discussion about Ritual on his website, which is out today as we record this episode. So we had a two-part discussion on this whole thing, and I thought it came out to be uh, to be a pretty a pretty fun time. Well, do you want me to tell you what our mutual boyfriend said about it? Well, yes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He no, he only had positive things. He did like the second film better than the first, though. Oh, I know. <laughs> okay. I'm sure he he makes no. I did call him out though, so I I guess I'll say I make him watch movies with me. You know, so because he betrayed me again and recorded with you on one of our game nights, I said, okay, well now you are watching a film with me and you're at my whim basically because we're in Oscar season. So I need to watch some of these films. So he complains when I make him watch these, but he's not complaining when you make him. It's, it's a toxic little triad we have here. I don't know why that, I get all I the made him watch. The only thing I made him watch that that he felt half done by was the series finale of the original Star Trek because it was very very misogynist and he and he said on the podcast, "Yes, I hate this. And I don't I don't know why you made me watch this," which made for a really good episode. Yeah, well, you get you get away with a lot more than I do. I have to say, so he's never. Oh, I would disagree with this. <laughs> you disagree. Wow. There are only two films I think that I've like f forced him to watch that he was not looking forward to, and that would be Babylon, which was three hours, and Five Nights at Freddy's. I saw that in theaters. You saw that in theaters? I thought I thought he saw that in theaters. You guys watch it together? Yes. Well, because it was on Peacock for free. Uh, oh, oh, okay. I never okay, turned okay. down a free film. Yeah. So, so I don't know what to say. Uh, the film that I made him watch was anatomy of a fall and he actually did like it so there we go a win in the game yep okay well any other uh oh uh, yes please go listen to that two-parter for sure any other books that you're reading power very soon um uh, uh <laughs> the android's dream of electric sheep is next on the Barnes Noble book club which i've also been um being absent from so it's not just you and uh, and I just I just really hope to read a lot more in this this coming. I feel I feel better. I feel more like myself when I read. And I since the pandemic, I really haven't read too much beyond comic books. So there is that. Anything that you want to mention? Oh, oh my I guess gosh, did you already run so your... many. No, I haven't gone oh. through. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll do this quickly. Um, At night, I become a monster by Yoru Sumina, and this was my nephew's book 
And my mother, his grandmother also read it and they kept recommending it. And so I finally read it. I did enjoy it. Something that Big D recommended to me, Unlikable Female Characters, The Women Pop Culture Wants You to Hate by Anna Bugutskaya. And mm. yeah, Donovan, maybe a couple of years ago. And then I tried to like find it. My library didn't have it. And now through some suspicious means, I have a library card through another library um, and they had it so I could finally read it. But I really enjoyed it, especially because she goes through a long uh, history of Hollywood. So it's not just recent stuff, but she's like mentioning um, older Hollywood actresses um, and, and like pre talkies and things like that. So it's also nice. been fun to mention some of the stuff that goes on and talk to my mom about it. Like, Oh, did you know this about this person? Like, did you know that was her name? Hedy Lamar had the first orgasm on screen. Like, is it like, <laughs> uh, but it's broken down kind of different, guess persona of of women like uh the bitch the slut the nag yeah, like that I, I skimmed kind of through it I, I, yeah I, yeah I yeah that. so i i recommend that uh definitely to the professor coca i think she would like that uh alien echo by mira grant which is a ya novel but it's a character that's in this alien game that harry and i play the normal heart by larry kramer found that randomly on uh on a little thing at uh, the high school I sub at. And I was like, oh, I'll take that. Ooh, a two and a manga that Big D got me 15 minutes before we really date volume one. And this is in Japanese. Oh no. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> melancholic. Also volume yes, one. Yes. So both of those I have loved. And then uh, oh, Dark great. Races by Jillian Flynn. And is there anything? Oh, and well, besides the, the price of salt. Happy Place by Emily Henry. Not my least favorite of hers, but it was painful to get through. It's a trope. Donovan and I have been talking about romance frequently, uh, romance novels and things and tropes. And I will confess that a great number of books, because I've probably read like 12 by now, I'm kind of in this uh, hole of smut right now that I can't seem to pull myself out of. But there's so many yeah. tropes. Every other trope, every other book I read not an exaggeration has the fake dating trope uh this one is somewhat that with happy place but it is one that i think i despise the most where it was a couple that was together broke up but they have to go somewhere with a group of friends so instead of telling the truth they think it's better to be together and then reveal it at some other time. And it's just emotionally painful. So it just took me longer to read because it was hard to pick it up. Once I was in it, it wasn't so bad, but I just don't like that. But I've noticed now with Emily Henry that she has a lot of kind of emotional manipulation storylines with the so beach mm. read is by far the best one of hers so that's the one i recommend so if you want some some of those tropes but yes i'm getting lots of uh interesting tropes i do like friends to lovers enemies to lovers i also enjoy the grumpy sunshine type of people i don't like friends with benefits because i just don't think that that exists personally um i know it literally exists but i just think it's it's too hard to do that and then the fake dating business which is practically friends with i just don't like that trope either but we're making it uh and now i'm connected kind of i mean it's not like i'm texting her to uh, one of donovan's colleagues because i asked <laughs> him to ask her like what's with all these hockey romances and then mm -hmm. also asked her thoughts on the the fake dating uh trope and what that came about but yeah lots of hockey romances that i'm into now so hopefully I'll get out of the smut sometime, but not in time for Valentine's Day. So this guy will actually be on the next episode. I don't think last year we did a shipper special because I was just like knee deep in work, but I've come up with the idea. We know what we're doing. Donovan hopefully remembers. If not, I'll remind him afterwards. But what it's it funny. <laughs> Um, it's funny you talked about a two part. This shipper special is going to be kind of a two year two part. Uh, it will connect to next year's as well. So I won't reveal what it is, but it it's I think it'll be fun. Uh, toxicity might abound. But yes, yeah, so look forward to that. So I guess no comics next month, but um, I'll do six and seven of Birds of Prey in the in the following month. So yeah. Uh, Donovan, you already kind of mentioned quinoa, but where else can people go and, and support you? 
I mean, I still, I still review Nightwing on uh, the BatmanUniverse.net, and I still uh, am very much employed by DCComics.com, writing content for them. The most recent published work that I have is Batman's Closest Calls. Five times Batman almost died but escaped with the skin of his cape. That was, that was fun to read. Man, we are almost rid of him five times. <laughs> <laughs> Bad are you, are you rest watching, in peace. Are you watching the um like the DC animated movies at all? <clears throat> like like Big Mom Crisis time. and stuff. Yeah, no, I'm not. The last one I saw was uh Long Halloween Part One. Okay, and I didn't care for it, so I've not seen them since. But I know that like they're doing Crisis on Infinite Earths. Yeah, and they have a preview for Part Two, and and Barbara Gordon Batgirl shows up. So I don't <gasps> know if you were, you were aware of that. I might need to. Someone did. I feel like the last one was Gotham by Gaslight that I watched. But then a recent one came out. The new editor of the Batman universe had texted or emailed me and said, are you watching these? But Barbara pops up. I was like, oh, so I guess I need to maybe catch up on on some of the Batman ones. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not paying attention. To, obviously, obviously, I say obviously, but like, honestly, I've not consistently enjoyed. I, I like some of the, the Titans ones fine. Uh, Death of Superman, but like they used to be really like 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 immediately when they came out, I get them, and they're not anymore. Yeah. Which is to say that they all suck, but yeah. um, they're not all um appointment viewing either. Yeah, well, at least they're on Max for free. So you for don't now. have to buy them. Yeah, I know. Seriously, for now. Okay, well, send any questions or comments to backworldtheoracle at gmail.com. If you played Spider Marvel Spider-Man 2, let us know what you think about it. Like the show on Facebook or follow it on Twitter, x Twitter uh, at Backworld the Oracle. <laughs> Subscribe to the show on YouTube for an uncut version, as well as seeing images that I put on the screen, like uh, Donovan's bodacious behind. No, I didn't put that on there. But he did shake it. He did shake it. Ba 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 ba. Follow the Batman Universe on Facebook and Twitter as well, and support the Batman Universe by subscribing to Patreon. Once again, thanks to Mile High Comics for sponsoring Backworld the Oracle, the Barbara Gordon podcast. And until next time. <gasps> Bye on, Babs lovers. Bye on, Babs lovers. Just plain Barbara Gordon masquerading for a lark as she rides into the night on her special Batgirl cycle. Who knows? Is the dynamic duo destined to become the triumphant trio? Only time will tell us more about this dazzling dare doll. I love a happy ending, don't you?